Section 13 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Zokaitis. The Oblong Box by Edgar Allan Poe. Some years ago, I engaged passage from Charleston, South Carolina, to the city of New York, in the fine packet ship Independence, Captain Hardy. We were to sail on the 15th of the month, June, weather permitting, and on the 14th I went on board to arrange some matters in my stateroom. I found that we were to have a great many passengers, including a more than usual number of ladies. On the list were several of my acquaintances, and among other names I was rejoiced to see that of Mr. Cornelius Wyatt, a young artist for whom I entertained feelings of warm friendship. He had been with me a fellow student at C. University, where we were very much together. He had the ordinary temperament of genius, and was a compound of misanthropy, sensibility, and enthusiasm. To these qualities he united the warmest and truest heart which ever beat in a human bosom. I observed that his name was carded upon three staterooms, and, upon again referring to the list of passengers, I found that he had engaged passage for himself, wife, and two sisters, his own. The staterooms were sufficiently roomy, and each had two berths, one above the other. These berths, to be sure, were so exceedingly narrow as to be insufficient for more than one person. Still, I could not comprehend why there were three staterooms for these four persons. I was, just at that epoch, in one of those moody frames of mind which make a man abnormally inquisitive about trifles, and I confess with shame that I busied myself in a variety of ill-bred and preposterous conjectures about this matter of the supernumerary stateroom. It was no business of mine, to be sure, but with none the less pertinacity did I occupy myself in attempts to resolve the enigma. At last I reached a conclusion which wrought in me great wonder why I had not arrived at it before. "'It is a servant, of course,' I said. "'What a fool I am, not sooner to have thought of so obvious a solution!' And then I again repaired to the list. But here I saw distinctly that no servant was to come with the party, although, in fact, it had been the original design to bring one, for the words, "'and servant,' had been first written, and then overscored. "'Oh, extra baggage, to be sure,' I now said to myself. "'Something he wishes not to be put in the hold. Something to be kept under his own eye. Ah, I have it. A painting or so. And this is what he has been bargaining about with Nicolino, the Italian Jew.' This idea satisfied me, and I dismissed my curiosity for the nonce. Wyatt's two sisters I knew very well, and most amiable and clever girls they were. His wife he had newly married, and I had never yet seen her. He had often talked about her in my presence, however, and in his usual style of enthusiasm. He described her as of surpassing beauty, wit, and accomplishment. I was, therefore, quite anxious to make her acquaintance. On the day in which I visited the ship, the 14th, Wyatt and party were also to visit it, so the captain informed me, and I waited on board an hour longer than I had designed, in hope of being presented to the bride, but then an apology came. Mrs. W. was a little indisposed, and would decline coming on board until tomorrow, at the hour of sailing. The morrow having arrived, I was going from my hotel to the wharf, when Captain Hardy met me and said that, owing to circumstances, a stupid but convenient phrase, he rather thought the independence would not sail for a day or two, and that when all was ready he would send up and let me know. 
This I thought strange, for there is a stiff southerly breeze, but as the circumstances were not forthcoming, although I pumped for them with much perseverance, I had nothing to do but to return home and digest my impatience at leisure. I did not receive the expected message from the captain for nearly a week. It came at length, however, and I immediately went on board. The ship was crowded with passengers, and everything was in the bustle attendant upon making sail. Wyatt's party arrived in about ten minutes after myself. There were the two sisters, the bride, and the artist, the latter in one of his customary fits of moody misanthropy. I was too well used to these, however, to pay them any special attention. He did not even introduce me to his wife, this courtesy devolving perforce upon his sister Marian, a very sweet and intelligent girl, who, in a few hurried words, made us acquainted. Mrs. Wyatt had been closely veiled, and when she raised her veil in acknowledging my bow, I confess that I was very profoundly astonished. I should have been much more so, however, had not long experience advised me not to trust, with too implicit a reliance, the enthusiastic descriptions of my friend, the artist, when indulging in comments upon the loveliness of woman. When beauty was the theme, I well knew with what facility he soared into the regions of the purely ideal. The truth is, I could not help regarding Mrs. Wyatt as a decidedly plain-looking woman. If not positively ugly, she was not, I think, very far from it. She was dressed, however, in exquisite taste, and then I had no doubt that she had captivated my friend's heart by the more enduring graces of the intellect and soul. She said very few words, and passed at once into her stateroom with Mr. W., my old inquisitiveness now returned. There was no servant. That was a settled point. I looked, therefore, for the extra baggage. After some delay a cart arrived at the wharf, with an oblong pine box, which was everything that seemed to be expected. Immediately upon its arrival we made sail, and in a short time were safely over the bar and standing out to sea. The box in question was, as I say, oblong. It was about six feet in length by two and a half in breadth. I observed it attentively and liked to be precise. Now this shape was peculiar, and no sooner had I seen it than I took credit to myself for the accuracy of my guessing. I had reached the conclusion, it will be remembered, that the extra baggage of my friend, the artist, would prove to be pictures, or at least a picture, for I knew he had been for several weeks in conference with Nicolino. And now here was a box, which, from its shape, could possibly contain nothing in the world but a copy of Leonardo's Last Supper, and a copy of this very Last Supper, done by Rubini the Younger at Florence, I had known, for some time, to be in the possession of Nicolino. This point, therefore, I considered as sufficiently settled. I chuckled excessively when I thought of my acumen. It was the first time I had ever known Wyatt to keep from me any of his artistical secrets, but here he evidently intended to steal a march upon me and smuggle a fine picture to New York under my very nose, expecting me to know nothing of the matter. I resolved to quiz him well, now and hereafter. One thing, however, annoyed me not a little. The box did not go into the extra stateroom. It was deposited in Wyatt's own, and there, too, it remained, occupying very nearly the whole of the floor, no doubt the exceeding discomfort of the artist and his wife. This the more especially as the tar or paint with which it was lettered in sprawling capitals emitted a strong, disagreeable, and, to my fancy, a peculiarly disgusting odor. On the lid were painted the words, Mrs. Adelaide Curtis, Albany, New York, Charge of Cornelius Wyatt, Esquire, this side up, to be handled with care. Now, 
i was aware that mrs adelaide curtis of albany was the artist's wife's mother but then i looked upon the whole address as a mystification intended especially for myself i made up my mind of course that the box and contents would never get farther north than the studio of my misanthropic friend in chambers street new york for the first three or four days we had fine weather although the wind was dead ahead having chopped round to the northward immediately upon our losing sight of the coast the passengers were consequently in high spirits and disposed to be social i must except however wyatt and his sisters who behaved stiffly and i could not help thinking uncourteously to the rest of the party wyatt's conduct i did not so much regard he was gloomy even beyond his usual habit in fact he was morose but in him i was prepared for eccentricity for the sisters however i could make no excuse they secluded themselves in their staterooms during the greater part of the passage and absolutely refused although i repeatedly urged them to hold communication with any person on board mrs wyatt herself was far more agreeable that is to say she was chatty and to be chatty is no slight recommendation at sea she became excessively intimate with most of the ladies and to my profound astonishment evinced no equivocal disposition to coquette with the men she amused us all very much i say amused and scarcely know how to explain myself the truth is i soon found that mrs w was far oftener laughed at than with the gentlemen said little about her but the ladies in a little while pronounced her a good-hearted thing rather indifferent-looking totally uneducated and decidedly vulgar the great wonder was how wyatt had been entrapped into such a match wealth was the general solution but this i knew to be no solution at all for wyatt had told me that she neither brought him a dollar nor had any expectations from any source whatever he had married he said for love and for love only and his bride was far more than worthy of his love when i thought of these expressions on the part of my friend i confess that i felt indescribably puzzled could it be possible that he was taking leave of his senses what else could i think he so refined so intellectual so fastidious with so exquisite a perception of the faulty and so keen an appreciation of the beautiful to be sure the lady seemed especially fond of him particularly so in his absence when she made herself ridiculous by frequent quotations of what had been said by her beloved husband mr wyatt the word husband seemed forever to use one of her own delicate expressions forever on the tip of her tongue in the meantime it was observed by all on board that he avoided her in the most pointed manner and for the most part shut himself up alone in his state-room where in fact he might have been said to live altogether leaving his wife at full liberty to amuse herself as she thought best in the public society of the main cabin my conclusion from what i saw and heard was that the artist by some unaccountable freak of fate or perhaps in some fit of enthusiastic and fanciful passion had been induced to unite himself with a person altogether beneath him and that the natural result entire and speedy disgust had ensued i pitied him from the bottom of my heart but could not for that reason quite forgive his incommunicativeness in the matter of the last supper for this i resolved to have my revenge one day he came upon deck and taking his arm as had been my wont i sauntered with him backward and forward his gloom however which i considered quite natural under the circumstances seemed entirely unabated he said little and that moodily and with evident effort i ventured a jest or two 
and he made a sickening attempt at a smile. Poor fellow! As I thought of his wife, I wondered that he could have heart to put on even the semblance of mirth. I determined to commence a series of covert insinuations, or innuendos, about the oblong box, just to let him perceive, gradually, that I was not altogether the butt or victim of his little bit of pleasant mystification. My first observation was by way of opening a masked battery. I said something about the peculiar shape of that box, and, as I spoke the words, I smiled knowingly, winked, and touched him gently with my forefinger in the ribs. The manner in which Wyatt received this harmless pleasantry convinced me, at once, that he was mad. At first he stared at me, as if he found it impossible to comprehend the witticism of my remark, but as its point seemed slowly to make its way into his brain, his eyes, in the same proportion, seemed protruding from their sockets. Then he grew very red, then hideously pale. Then, as if highly amused with what I had insinuated, he began a loud and boisterous laugh, which, to my astonishment, he kept up, with gradually increasing vigor, for ten minutes or more. In conclusion he fell flat and heavily upon the deck. When I ran to uplift him, to all appearance he was dead. I called assistance, and with much difficulty we brought him to himself. Upon reviving he spoke incoherently for some time. At length, we bled him and put him to bed. The next morning he was quite recovered, so far as regarded his mere bodily health. Of his mind I say nothing, of course. I avoided him during the rest of the passage, by advice of the captain, who seemed to coincide with me altogether in my views of his insanity, but cautioned me to say nothing on this head to any person on board. Several circumstances occurred immediately after this fit of Wyatt, which contributed to heighten the curiosity with which I was already possessed. Among other things, this. I had been nervous, drank too much strong green tea, and slept ill at night. In fact, for two nights I could not be properly said to sleep at all. Now, my stateroom opened into the main cabin, or dining room as did those of all the single men on board. Wyatt's three rooms were in the after-cabin, which was separated from the main one by a slight sliding door, never locked even at night. As we were almost constantly on a wind, and the breeze was not a little stiff, the ship heeled to leeward very considerably, and whenever her starboard side was to leeward, the sliding door between the cabins slid open and so remained, nobody taking the trouble to get up and shut it. But my berth was in such a position that when my own stateroom door was open, as well as the sliding door in question, and my own door was always open on account of the heat, I could see into the after-cabin quite distinctly, and just at that portion of it, too, where were situated the staterooms of Mr. Wyatt. Well, during two nights— not consecutive. While I lay awake, I clearly saw Mrs. W., about eleven o'clock upon each night, steal cautiously from the stateroom of Mr. W., and enter the extra room, where she remained until daybreak, when she was called by her husband and went back. That they were virtually separated was clear. They had separate apartments, no doubt in contemplation of a more permanent divorce, and here, after all, I thought was the mystery of the extra stateroom. There was another circumstance, too, which interested me much. During the two wakeful nights in question, and immediately after the disappearance of Mrs. Wyatt into the extra stateroom, I was attracted by certain singular, cautious, subdued noises in that of her husband. After listening to them for some time, with thoughtful attention, I at length succeeded perfectly in translating their import. They were sounds occasioned by the artist in prying open the oblong box, 
by means of a chisel and mallet, the latter being apparently muffled or deadened by some soft woolen or cotton substance in which its head was enveloped. In this manner I fancied I could distinguish the precise moment when he fairly disengaged the lid, also that I could determine when he removed it altogether, and when he deposited it upon the lower berth in his room. This latter point I knew, for example, by certain slight taps which the lid made in striking against the wooden edges of the berth, as he endeavoured to lay it down very gently, there being no room for it on the floor. After this there was a dead stillness, and I heard nothing more, upon either occasion, until nearly daybreak, unless, perhaps, I may mention a low sobbing or murmuring sound, so very much suppressed as to be nearly inaudible, if, indeed, the whole of this latter noise were not rather produced by my own imagination. I say it seemed to resemble sobbing or sighing, but, of course, it could not have been either. I rather think it was a ringing in my own ears. Mr. Wyatt, no doubt, according to custom, was merely giving the rein to one of his hobbies, indulging in one of his fits of artistic enthusiasm. He had opened his oblong box in order to feast his eyes on the pictorial treasure within. There was nothing in this, however, to make him sob. I repeat, therefore, that it must have been simply a freak of my own fancy, distempered by good Captain Hardy's green tea. Just before dawn, on each of the two nights of which I speak, I distinctly heard Mr. Wyatt replace the lid upon the oblong box, and force the nails into their old places by means of the muffled mallet. Having done this, he issued from his stateroom, fully dressed, and proceeded to call Mrs. W. from hers. We had been at sea seven days, and were now off Cape Hatteras, when there came a tremendously heavy blow from the southwest. We were, in a measure, prepared for it, however, as the weather had been holding out threats for some time. Everything was made snug, alow and aloft, and as the wind steadily freshened, we lay to, at length, under spanker and foretopsail, both double-reefed. In this trim we rode safely enough for forty-eight hours, the ship proving herself an excellent sea-boat in many respects, and shipping no water of any consequence. At the end of this period, however, the gale had freshened into a hurricane, and our after sail split into ribbons, bringing us so much in the trough of the water that we shipped several prodigious seas, one immediately after the other. By this accident we lost three men overboard with the caboose, and nearly the whole of the larboard bulwarks. Scarcely had we recovered our senses, before the foretop sail went into shreds, when we got up a storm stay sail, and with this did pretty well for some hours, the ship heading the sea much more steadily than before. The gale still held on, however, and we saw no signs of its abating. The rigging was found to be ill-fitted, and greatly strained and on the third day of the blow, about five in the afternoon, our mizzenmast, in a heavy lurch to windward, went by the board. For an hour or more we tried in vain to get rid of it, on account of the prodigious rolling of the ship, and, before we had succeeded, the carpenter came aft and announced four feet of water in the hold. To add to our dilemma, we found the pumps choked and nearly useless. All was now confusion and despair, but an effort was made to lighten the ship by throwing overboard as much of her cargo as could be reached, and by cutting away the two masts that remained. This we at last accomplished, but we were still unable to do anything at the pumps, and, in the meantime, the leak gained on us very fast. At sundown, the gale had sensibly diminished in violence, and as the sea went down with it, we still entertained faint hopes of saving ourselves in the boats. 
at eight p.m. the clouds broke away to windward, and we had the advantage of a full moon, a piece of good fortune, which served wonderfully to cheer our drooping spirits. After incredible labor we succeeded, at length, in getting the long-boat over the side without material accident, and into this we crowded the whole of the crew and most of the passengers. This party made off immediately, and, after undergoing much suffering, finally arrived, in safety, at Ocracoke Inlet, on the third day after the wreck. Fourteen passengers, with the captain, remained on board, resolving to trust their fortunes to the jolly boat at the stern. We lowered it without difficulty, although it was only by a miracle that we prevented it from swamping as it touched the water. It contained, when afloat, the captain and his wife, Mr. Wyatt and party, a Mexican officer, wife, four children, and myself, with a negro valet. We had no room, of course, for anything except a few positively necessary instruments, some provisions, and the clothes upon our backs. No one had thought of even attempting to save anything more. What must have been the astonishment of all, then, when having proceeded a few fathoms from the ship, Mr. Wyatt stood up in the stern sheets, and coolly demanded of Captain Hardy that the boat should be put back for the purpose of taking in his oblong box. "'Sit down, Mr. Wyatt,' replied the captain, somewhat sternly. "'You will capsize us if you do not sit quite still. Our gunwale is almost in the water now.' "'The box!' vociferated Mr. Wyatt, still standing. "'The box, I say. Captain Hardy, you cannot, you will not refuse me. Its weight will be but a trifle. It is nothing, mere nothing. By the mother who bore you, for the love of heaven, by your hope of salvation, I implore you to put back for the box.' The captain, for a moment, seemed touched by the earnest appeal of the artist, but he regained his stern composure and merely said, "'Mr. Wyatt, you are mad. I cannot listen to you. Sit down, I say, or you will swamp the boat. Stay. Hold him. Seize him. He is about to spring overboard. There. I knew it. He is over.' And so the captain said this, Mr. Wyatt, in fact, sprang from the boat, and, as we were yet in the lee of the wreck, succeeded, by almost superhuman exertion, in getting hold of a rope which hung from the forechains. In another moment he was on board, and rushing frantically down into the cabin. In the meantime we had been swept astern of the ship, and being quite out of her lee, were at the mercy of the tremendous sea which was still running. We made a determined effort to put back, but our little boat was like a feather in the breach of the tempest. We saw at a glance that the doom of the unfortunate artist was sealed. As our distance from the wreck rapidly increased, the madman, for as such only could we regard him, was seen to emerge from the companionway, up which, by dint of strength that appeared gigantic, he dragged, bodily, the oblong box, while we gazed in the extremity of astonishment, he passed rapidly several turns of a three-inch rope, first around the box and then around his body. In another instant both body and box were in the sea, disappearing suddenly, at once and forever. We lingered a while sadly upon our oars, with our eyes riveted upon the spot. At length we pulled away, the silence remained unbroken for an hour. Finally, I hazarded a remark. Did you observe, Captain, how suddenly they sank? Was not that an exceedingly singular thing? I confess that I entertained some feeble hope of his final deliverance when I saw him lash himself to the box and commit himself to the sea. They sank as a matter of course, replied the Captain, and that like a shot. They will soon rise again, however, but not until the salt melts. The salt! I ejaculated. Hush! said the captain, pointing to the wife and sisters of the deceased. 
We must talk of these things at some more appropriate time. We suffered much, and made a narrow escape, but fortune befriended us, as well as our mates in the longboat. We landed, in fine, more dead than alive, after four days of intense distress, upon the beach opposite Roanoke Island. We remained here a week, were not ill-treated by the wreckers, and at length obtained a passage to New York. About a month after the loss of the independence, I happened to meet Captain Hardy in Broadway. Our conversation turned, naturally, upon the disaster, and especially upon the sad fate of poor Wyatt. I thus learned the following particulars. The artist had engaged passage for himself, wife, two sisters, and a servant. His wife was, indeed, as she had been represented, a most lovely and most accomplished woman. On the morning of the 14th of June, the day in which I first visited the ship, the lady suddenly sickened and died. The young husband was frantic with grief, but circumstances imperatively forbade the deferring his voyage to New York. It was necessary to take to her mother the corpse of his adored wife, and, on the other hand, the universal prejudice which would prevent his doing so openly was well known. Nine-tenths of the passengers would have abandoned the ship rather than take passage with a dead body. In this dilemma, Captain Hardy arranged that the corpse, being first partially embalmed and packed with a large quantity of salt, in a box of suitable dimensions, should be conveyed on board as merchandise. Nothing was to be said of the lady's decease, and, as it was well understood that Mr. Wyatt had engaged passage for his wife, it became necessary that some person should personate her during the voyage. This the deceased lady's maid was easily prevailed on to do. The extra stateroom, originally engaged for this girl during her mistress's life, was now merely retained. In this stateroom the pseudo-wife slept, of course, every night. In the daytime she performed, to the best of her ability, the part of her mistress, whose person, it had been carefully ascertained, was unknown to any of the passengers on board. My own mistake arose, naturally enough, through too careless, too inquisitive, and too impulsive a temperament. But of late— it is a rare thing that I sleep soundly at night. There is a countenance which haunts me, turn as I will. There is an hysterical laugh which will forever ring within my ears. End of section 13《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
when to my extreme horror and astonishment I discovered that I had lost my breath. The phrases, I am out of breath, I have lost my breath, etc., are often enough repeated in common conversation, but it had never occurred to me that the terrible accident of which I speak could bona fide and actually happen. Imagine, that is, if you have a fanciful turn. Imagine, I say, my wonder, my consternation, my despair. There is a good genius, however, which has never entirely deserted me. In my most ungovernable moods, I still retain a sense of propriety. Et le chemin des passions de conduit, as Lord Edward in the Julie says it did him, a la philosophie veritable. Although I could not at first precisely ascertain to what degree the occurrence had affected me, I determined at all events to conceal the matter from my wife, until further experience should discover to me the extent of this my unheard-of calamity. Altering my countenance, therefore, in a moment, from its be-puffed and distorted appearance, to an expression of arch and coquettish benignity, I gave my lady a pat on the one cheek, and a kiss on the other, and without saying one syllable, furies, I could not, left her astonished at my drollery, as I pirouetted out of the room in a pas de zephyr. Behold me, then, safely ensconced in my private boudoir, a fearful instance of the ill consequences attending upon irascibility, alive, with the qualifications of the dead, dead, with the propensities of the living, an anomaly on the face of the earth, being very calm, yet breathless. Yes, breathless. I am serious in asserting that my breath was entirely gone. I could not have stirred with it a feather if my life had been at issue, or sullied even the delicacy of a mirror. Hard fate! Yet there was some alleviation to the first overwhelming paroxysm of my sorrow. I found upon trial that the powers of utterance which, upon my inability to proceed in the conversation with my wife, I then concluded to be totally destroyed, were in fact only partially impeded, and I discovered that had I, at that interesting crisis, dropped my voice to a singularity deep guttural, I might still have continued to her the communication of my sentiments. This pitch of voice, the guttural depending, I find, not upon the current of the breath, but upon a certain spasmodic action of the muscles of the throat. Throwing myself upon a chair, I remained for some time absorbed in meditation. My reflections, to be sure, were of no consolatory kind. A thousand vague and lacrimatory fancies took possession of my soul, and even the idea of suicide flitted across my brain. But it is a trait in the perversity of human nature to reject the obvious and the ready for the far distant and equivocal. Thus I shuddered at self-murder as the most decided of atrocities while the tabby cat purred strenuously upon the rug, and the very water-dog wheezed assiduously under the table, each taking to itself much merit for the strength of its lungs, and all obviously done in derision of my own pulmonary incapacity. Oppressed with a tumult of vague hopes and fears, I at length heard the footsteps of my wife descending the staircase. Being now assured of her absence, I returned with a palpitating heart to the scene of my disaster. Carefully locking the door on the inside, I commenced a vigorous search. It was possible, I thought, that, concealed in some obscure corner, or lurking in some closet or drawer, might be found the object of my inquiry. It might have a vapory, it might even have a tangible form. Most philosophers, upon many points of philosophy, are still very unphilosophical. William Godwin, however, says in his Mandeville, that invisible things are the only realities and this, all will allow, is a case in point. I would have the judicious reader pause before accusing such asseverations of an undue quantum of absurdity. Anaxagoras, it will be remembered, maintained that snow is black, and this I have since found to be the case. Long and earnestly did I continue the investigation, but the contemptible reward of my industry and perseverance proved to be only a set of false teeth, two pair of hips, an eye, and a bundle of billet doux from Mr. Windenough to my wife, 
I might as well here observe that this confirmation of my lady's partiality for Mr. W. occasioned me little uneasiness. That Mrs. Lackobreath should admire anything so dissimilar to myself was a natural and necessary evil. I am, it is well known, of a robust and corpulent appearance, and at the same time somewhat diminutive in stature. What wonder, then, that the lath-like tenuity of my acquaintance, and his altitude, which has grown into a proverb, should have met with all due estimation in the eyes of Mrs. Lackobreath? But to return. My exertions, as I have said before, proved fruitless. Closet after closet, drawer after drawer, corner after corner, were scrutinized to no purpose. At one time, however, I thought myself sure of my prize, having, in rummaging a dressing-case, accidentally demolished a bottle of Grand Jean's Oil of Archangels, which, as an agreeable perfume, I here take the liberty of recommending. With a heavy heart I returned to my boudoir, there to ponder upon some method of eluding my wife's penetration, until I could make arrangements prior to my leaving the country, for to this I had already made up my mind. In a foreign climate, being unknown, I might, with some probability of success, endeavor to conceal my unhappy calamity, a calamity calculated even more than beggary, to estrange the affections of the multitude, and to draw down upon the wretch the well-merited indignation of the virtuous and the happy. I was not long in hesitation. Being naturally quick, I committed to memory the entire tragedy of Metamora. I had the good fortune to recollect that in the accentuation of this drama, or at least of such portion of it as is allotted to the hero, the tones of voice in which I found myself deficient were altogether unnecessary, and the deep guttural was expected to reign monotonously throughout. I practiced for some time by the borders of a well-frequented marsh. Herein, however, having no reference to a similar proceeding of Demosthenes, but from a design peculiarly and conscientiously my own. Thus armed at all points, I determined to make my wife believe that I was suddenly smitten with a passion for the stage. In this I succeeded to a miracle, and to every question or suggestion found myself at liberty to reply in my most frog-like and sepulchral tones with some passage from the tragedy any portion of which, as I soon took great pleasure in observing, would apply equally well to any particular subject. It is not to be supposed, however, that in the delivery of such passages I was found at all deficient in the looking asquint, the showing my teeth, the working my knees, the shuffling my feet, or in any of those unmentionable graces which are now justly considered the characteristics of a popular performer. To be sure, they spoke of confining me in a straitjacket, but, good God, they never suspected me of having lost my breath. Having at length put my affairs in order, I took my seat very early one morning in the mail stage for giving it to be understood among my acquaintances that business of the last importance required my immediate personal attendance in that city. The coach was crammed to repletion, but in the uncertain twilight the features of my companions could not be distinguished. Without making any effectual resistance, I suffered myself to be placed between two gentlemen of colossal dimensions, while a third, of a size larger, requesting pardon for the liberty he was about to take, threw himself upon my body at full length, and falling asleep in an instant, drowned all my guttural ejaculations for relief in a snore which would have put to blush the roarings of the bull of Phalaris. Happily, the state of my respiratory faculties rendered suffocation an accident entirely out of the question. As, however, the day broke more distinctly in our approach to the outskirts of the city, my tormentor, arising and adjusting his shirt-collar, thanked me in a very friendly manner for my civility. Seeing that I remained motionless, all my limbs were dislocated and my head twisted on one side, his apprehensions began to be excited and arousing the rest of the passengers, he communicated in a very decided manner his opinion that a dead man had been palmed upon them during the night for a living and responsible fellow-traveller. Here, giving me a thump on the right eye by way of demonstrating the truth of his suggestion. Hereupon all, one after another, there were nine in company, believed it their duty to pull me by the ear. A young practicing physician, too, 
having applied a pocket mirror to my mouth, and found me without breath. The assertion of my persecutor was pronounced a true bill, and the whole party expressed a determination to endure tamely no such impositions for the future, and to proceed no farther with any such carcasses for the present. I was here, accordingly, thrown out at the sign of the crow, by which tavern the coach happened to be passing, without meeting with any farther accident than the breaking of both my arms under the left hind wheel of the vehicle. I must besides do the driver the justice to state that he did not forget to throw after me the largest of my trunks, which, unfortunately, falling on my head, fractured my skull in a manner at once interesting and extraordinary. The landlord of the crow, who is a hospitable man, finding that my trunk contained sufficient to indemnify him for any little trouble he might take in my behalf, sent forthwith for a surgeon of his acquaintance, and delivered me to his care with a bill and receipt for ten dollars. The purchaser took me to his apartments and commenced operations immediately. Having cut off my ears, however, he discovered signs of animation. He now rang the bell, and sent for a neighboring apothecary with whom to consult in the emergency. In case of his suspicions with regard to my existence proving ultimately correct, he, in the meantime, made an incision in my stomach and removed several of my viscera for private dissection. The apothecary had an idea that I was actually dead. This idea I endeavored to confute, kicking and plunging with all my might, and making the most furious contortions, for the operations of the surgeon had, in a measure, restored me to the possession of my faculties. All, however, was attributed to the effects of a new galvanic battery, wherewith the apothecary, who is really a man of information, performed several curious experiments, in which, from my personal share in their fulfillment, I could not help feeling deeply interested. It was a course of mortification to me, nevertheless, that although I made several attempts at conversation, my powers of speech were so entirely in abeyance that I could not even open my mouth much less, then, make reply to some ingenious but fanciful theories of which, under other circumstances, my minute acquaintance with the Hippocratian pathology would have afforded me a ready confutation. Not being able to arrive at a conclusion, the practitioners remanded me for farther examination. I was taken up into a garret, and the surgeon's lady having accommodated me with drawers and stockings, the surgeon himself fastened my hands and tied up my jaws with a pocket handkerchief, then bolted the door on the outside as he hurried to his dinner, leaving me alone to silence and to meditation. I now discovered to my extreme delight that I could have spoken had not my mouth been tied up with the pocket handkerchief. Consoling myself with this reflection, I was mentally repeating some passages of the omnipresence of the deity, as is my custom before resigning myself to sleep, when two cats, of a greedy and vituperative turn, entering at a hole in the wall, leaped up with a flourish a la Catalani, and alighting opposite one another on my visage, betook themselves to indecorous contention for the paltry consideration of my nose. But, as the loss of his ears proved the means of elevating to the throne of Cyrus the Magian or Majgush of Persia, and as the cutting off his nose gave Zopyrus possession of Babylon, so the loss of a few ounces of my countenance proved the salvation of my body. Aroused by the pain, and burning with indignation, I burst at a single effort the fastenings and the bandage. Stalking across the room, I cast a glance of contempt at the belligerents, and throwing open the sash to their extreme horror and disappointment, precipitated myself very dexterously from the window. This moment passing from the city jail to the scaffold erected for his execution in the suburbs. His extreme infirmity and long continued ill health had obtained him the privilege of remaining unmanacled, and habited in his gallows costume, one very similar to my own, he lay at full length in the bottom of the hangman's cart, which happened to be under the windows of the surgeon at the moment of my precipitation, without any other guard than the driver, who was asleep and two recruits of the 6th Infantry who were drunk. As ill luck would have it, I alit upon my feet within the vehicle. Immediately he bolted out behind, and turned down an alley, and was out of sight in the twinkling of an eye. The recruits, aroused by the bustle, could not exactly comprehend the merits of the transaction. Seeing, however, a man, 
the precise counterpart of the felon, standing upright in the cart before their eyes, they were of, so they expressed themselves, and having communicated this opinion to one another, they took each a dram, and then knocked me down with the butt-ends of their muskets. It was not long ere we arrived at the place of destination. Of course nothing could be said in my defense. Hanging was my inevitable fate. I resigned myself thereto with a feeling half stupid, half acrimonious. Being little of a cynic, I had all the sentiments of a dog. The hangman, however, adjusted the noose about my neck. The drop fell. I forbear to depict my sensations upon the gallows, although here, undoubtedly, I could speak to the point, and it is a topic upon which nothing has been well said. In fact, to write upon such a theme, it is necessary to have been hanged. Every author should confine himself to matters of experience. Thus, Mark Antony composed a treatise upon getting drunk. I may just mention, however, that die I did not. My body was, but I had no breath to be suspended, and but for the knot under my left ear, which had the feel of a military stock, I dare say that I should have experienced very little inconvenience. As for the jerk given to my neck upon the falling of the drop, it merely proved a corrective to the twist afforded me by the fat gentleman in the coach. For good reasons, however, I did my best to give the crowd the worth of their trouble. My convulsions were said to be extraordinary. My spasms it would have been difficult to beat. The populace encored. Several gentlemen swooned, and a multitude of ladies were carried home in hysterics. Pinksit availed himself of the opportunity to retouch, from a sketch taken upon the spot, his admirable painting of the Marcias flayed alive. When I had afforded sufficient amusement, it was thought proper to remove my body from the gallows. This the more especially, as the real culprit had in the meantime been retaken and recognized, a fact which I was so unlucky as not to know. Much sympathy was, of course, exercised in my behalf and as no one made claim to my corpse, it was ordered that I should be interred in a public vault. Here, after due interval, I was deposited. The sexton departed, and I was left alone. A line of Marston's malcontent. Death's a good fellow and keeps open house, struck me at that moment as a palpable lie. I knocked off, however, the lid of my coffin, and stepped out. The place was dreadfully dreary and damp, and I became troubled with ennui. By way of amusement, I felt my way among the numerous coffins ranged in order around. I lifted them down one by one, and breaking open their lids, busied myself in speculations about the mortality within. This, I soliloquized, tumbling over a carcass, puffy, bloated, and rotund, this has been, no doubt, in every sense of the word, an unhappy and unfortunate man. It has been his terrible lot not to walk but to waddle, to pass through life not like a human being, but like an elephant, not like a man, but like a rhinoceros. His attempts at getting on have been more abortions, and his circumgyratory proceedings a palpable failure. Taking a step forward, it has been his misfortune to take two toward the right and three toward the left. His studies have been confined to the poetry of Crabbe. He can have no idea of the wonder of a pirouette. To him, a pas de papillon has been an abstract conception. He has never ascended the summit of a hill. He has never viewed from any steeple the glories of a metropolis. Heat has been his mortal enemy. In the dog days, his days have been the days of a dog. Therein, he has dreamed of flames and suffocation, of mountains upon mountains, of pelion upon osa. He was short of breath. To say all in a word, he was short of breath. He thought it extravagant to play upon wind instruments. He was the inventor of self-moving fans, wind sails, and ventilators. He patronized Dupont, the bellows-maker, and he died miserably in attempting to smoke a cigar. His was a case in which I feel a deep interest, a lot in which I sincerely sympathize. But here, said I, here, and I dragged spitefully from its receptacle a gaunt, tall, and peculiar-looking form, whose remarkable appearance struck me with a sense of unwelcome familiarity. Here is a wretch entitled to no earthly commiseration. Thus saying, in order to obtain a more distinct view of my subject, I applied my thumb and forefinger to its nose, 
and causing it to assume a sitting position upon the ground, held it thus, at the length of my arm, while I continued my soliloquy. Entitled, I repeated, to no earthly commiseration. Who, indeed, would think of compassioning a shadow? Besides, has he not had his full share of the blessings of mortality? He was the originator of tall monuments, shot towers, lightning rods, Lombardy poplars. His treatise upon shades and shadows has immortalized him. He edited with distinguished ability the last edition of South on the Bones. He went early to college and studied pneumatics. He then came home, talked eternally, and played upon the French horn. He patronized the bagpipes. Captain Barclay, who walked against time, would not walk against him. Wyndham and Albreth were his favorite writers, his favorite artist, Fizz. He died gloriously while inhaling gas, la vic flatu corrupitur, like the fama pudicate in Hieronymus. He was indubitably a... How can you, how can you, interrupted the object of my animadversions, gasping for breath and tearing off, with a desperate exertion, the bandage around its jaws. How can you, Mr. Lackobreath, be so infernally cruel as to pinch me in that manner on my nose? Did you not see how they fastened up my mouth? And you must know, if you know anything, how vast a superfluity of breath I have to dispose of. If you do not know, however, sit down and you shall see. In my situation it is really a great relief to be able to open one's mouth, to be able to expatiate, to be able to communicate with a person like yourself, who do not think yourself called upon at every period to interrupt the thread of a gentleman's discourse. Interruptions are annoying and should undoubtedly be abolished, don't you think so? No reply, I beg you. One person is enough to be speaking at a time, and I shall be done by and by, and then you may begin. How the devil, sir, did you get into this place? Not a word, I beseech you. Been here some time myself. Terrible accident. Heard of it, I suppose? Awful calamity. Walking under your windows some short while ago, about the time you were stage-struck. Horrible occurrence. Heard of catching one's breath, eh? Hold your tongue, I tell you. I caught somebody else's. Had always too much of my own. Met Blab at the corner of the street. Wouldn't give me a chance for a word. Couldn't get in a syllable edgeways. Attacked, consequently, with epilepsis. Blab made his escape. Damn all fools. They took me up for dead, and put me in this place. Pretty doings, all of them. Heard all you said about me. Every word a lie. Horrible. Wonderful. Outrageous. Hideous. Incomprehensible. Etc., 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 etc. It is impossible to conceive my astonishment at so unexpected a discourse, or the joy with which I became gradually convinced that the breath so fortunately caught by the gentleman, whom I soon recognized as my neighbor, wind enough, was in fact the identical expiration mislaid by myself in the conversation with my wife. Time, place, and circumstances rendered it a matter beyond question. I did not at least during the long period in which the inventor of Lombardy poplars continued to favor me with his explanations. In this respect I was actuated by that habitual prudence which has never been my predominating trait. I reflected that many difficulties might still lie in the path of my preservation, which only extreme exertion on my part would be able to surmount. Many persons, I considered, are prone to estimate commodities in their possession, however valueless to the then proprietor however troublesome or distressing, in direct ratio with the advantages to be derived by others from their attainment, or by themselves from their abandonment. Might not this be the case with Mr. Windenoff? Is displaying anxiety for the breath of which he was at present so willing to get rid, might I not lay myself open to the exactions of his avarice? There are scoundrels in this world, I remembered with a sigh, who will not scruple to take unfair opportunities with even a next-door neighbor, and, this remark is from Epictetus, it is precisely at that time when men are most anxious to throw off the burden of their own calamities that they feel the least desirous of relieving them in others. Upon considerations similar to these, and still retaining my grasp upon the nose of Mr. W., I accordingly thought proper to model my reply. Monster, I began, in a tone of the deepest indignation. Monster and double-winded idiot! Dost thou, whom for thine iniquities it has pleased heaven to accurse with a twofold respimption, 
Dost thou, I say, presume to address me in the familiar language of an old acquaintance? I lie, forsooth, and hold my tongue, to be sure. Pretty conversation indeed to a gentleman with a single breath. All this, too, when I have it in my power to relieve the calamity under which thou dost so justly suffer, to curtail the superfluities of thine unhappy respiration. Like Brutus, I paused for a reply, with which, like a tornado, Mr. Windenough immediately overwhelmed me. Protestation followed upon protestation, and apology upon apology. There were no terms with which he was unwilling to comply, and there were none of which I failed to take the fullest advantage. Preliminaries being at length arranged, my acquaintance delivered me the respiration, for which, having carefully examined it, I gave him afterward a receipt. I am aware that by many I shall be held to blame for speaking in a manner so cursory, of a transaction so impalpable. It will be thought that I should have entered more minutely into the details of an occurrence by which, and this is very true, much new light might be thrown upon a highly interesting branch of physical philosophy. To all this I am sorry that I cannot reply. A hint is the only answer which I am permitted to make. There were circumstances, and I think it much safer upon consideration to say as little as possible about an affair so delicate, so delicate, I repeat, and at the time involving the interests of a third party, whose sulfurous resentment I have not the least desire at this moment of incurring. We were not long after this necessary arrangement in effecting an escape from the dungeons of the sepulchre. The united strength of our resuscitated voices was soon sufficiently apparent. Scissors, the Whig editor, republished a treatise upon the nature and origin of subterranean noises. A reply, rejoinder, confutation, and justification followed in the columns of a democratic gazette. It was not until the opening of the vault to decide the controversy that the appearance of Mr. Windenough and myself proved both parties to have been decidedly in the wrong. I cannot conclude these details of some very singular passages in a life at all times sufficiently eventful, without again recalling to the attention of the reader the merits of that indiscriminate philosophy, which is a sure and ready shield against those shafts of calamity which can neither be seen, felt, nor fully understood. It was in the spirit of this wisdom that, among the ancient Hebrews, it was believed the gates of heaven would be inevitably opened to that sinner or saint who, with good lungs and implicit confidence, should vociferate the word, Amen. It was in the spirit of this wisdom that, when a great plague raged at Athens, and every means had been in vain attempted for its removal, Epimenides, as Laertius relates in his second book of that philosopher, advised the erection of a shrine and temple to the proper god. End of section 14. Recording by Lee Smalley. Section 15 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wupperhippo. The Man That Was Used Up by Edgar Allan Poe. A Tale of the Late Bugaboo and Kickapoo Campaign. Pleurez, pleurez, messieurs, et fondez-vous en eau. La moitié de ma vie a mis l'autre au tombeau. Corneille. I cannot just now remember when or where I first made the acquaintance of the truly fine-looking fellow, Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith. Someone did introduce me to the gentleman, I am sure, at some public meeting I know very well, held about something of great importance, no doubt, at some place or other, I feel convinced, whose name I have unaccountably forgotten. The truth is that the introduction was attended upon my part with a degree of anxious embarrassment which operated to prevent any definite impressions of either time or place. I am constitutionally nervous. This with me is a family failing, and I can't help it in special the slightest appearance of mystery of any point I cannot exactly comprehend puts me at once into a pitiable state of agitation. 
there was something, as it were, remarkable. Yes, remarkable. Although this is but a feeble term to express my full meaning about the entire individuality of the personage in question. He was perhaps six feet in height and of a presence singularly commanding. There was an air distinct way pervading the whole man which spoke of high breeding and hinted at high birth. Upon this topic, the topic of Smith's personal appearance, I have a kind of melancholy satisfaction in being minute. His head of hair would have done honor to a Brutus. Nothing could be more richly flowing or possess a brighter gloss. It was of a jetty black, which was also the color, or more probably the no color, of his unimaginable whiskers. You perceive I cannot speak of these latter without enthusiasm. It is not too much to say that they were the handsomest pair of whiskers under the sun. At all events they encircled, and at times partially overshadowed a mouth utterly unequaled. Here were the most entirely even and the most brilliantly white of all conceivable teeth. From between them, upon every proper occasion, issued a voice of surpassing clearness, melody and strength. In the matter of eyes also, my acquaintance was preeminently endowed. Either one of such a pair was worth a couple of the ordinary ocular organs. They were of deep hazel, exceedingly large and lustrous, and there was perceptible about them, ever and anon, just that amount of interesting obliquity which gives pregnancy to expression. The bust of the general was unquestionably the finest bust I ever saw. For your life you could not have found a fault with its wonderful proportion. This rare peculiarity set off to great advantage a pair of shoulders which would have called up a blush of conscious inferiority into the countenance of the marble Apollo. I have a passion for fine shoulders and may say that I never beheld them in perfection before. The arms altogether were admirably modelled, nor were the lower limbs less superb. These were indeed the ne plus ultra of good legs. Every connoisseur in such matters admitted the legs to be good. There was neither too much flesh nor too little, neither rudeness nor fragility. I could not imagine a more graceful curve than that of the os femoris, and there was just that due gentle prominence in the rear of the fibula which goes to the confirmation of a properly proportioned calf. I wish to God my young and talented friend Ciponcipino, the sculptor, had but seen the legs of Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith. But although men so absolutely fine-looking are neither as plenty as reasons or blackberries, still I could not bring myself to believe that the remarkable something to which I alluded just now, that the odd air of je ne sais quoi which hung about my new acquaintance, lay altogether, or indeed at all, in the supreme excellence of his bodily endowments. Perhaps it might be traced to the manner, yet here again I could not pretend to be positive. There was a primness, not to say stiffness, in his carriage, a degree of measured and, if I may so express it, of rectangular precision, attending his every movement, which, observed in a more diminutive figure, would have had the least little savour in the world, of affectation, pomposity or constraint, but which noticed in a gentleman of his undoubted dimensions, was readily placed to the account of reserve auteur, of a commendable sense, in short, of what is due to the dignity of colossal proportion. The kind friend who presented me to General Smith whispered in my ear some few words of comment upon the man. He was a remarkable man, a very remarkable man, indeed one of the most remarkable men of the age. He was an especial favorite, too, with the ladies, chiefly on account of his high reputation for courage. In that point he is unrivaled, 
Indeed, he is a perfect desperado, a downright fire eater, and no mistake," said my friend, here dropping his voice excessively low, and thrilling me with the mystery of his tone. A downright fire eater, and no mistake. Showed that, I should say, to some purpose, in the late tremendous swamp fight away down south, with the Bugaboo and Kickapoo Indians. Here my friend opened his eyes to some extent. Bless my soul, blood and thunder and all that, prodigies of valor. Heard of him, of course. You know, he's the man. Man alive, how do you do? Why, how are you? Very glad to see you indeed. Here interrupted the general himself. Seizing my companion by the hand as he drew near, and bowing stiffly but profoundly as I was presented. I then thought, and I think so still, that I never heard a clearer nor a stronger voice, nor beheld a finer set of teeth. But I must say that I was sorry for the interruption just at that moment, as owing to the whispers and insinuations aforesaid, my interest had been greatly excited in the hero of the Bugaboo and Kickapoo campaign. However, the delightfully luminous conversation of Brevet Brigadier General John A. B. C. Smith soon completely dissipated this chagrin. My friend, leaving us immediately, we had quite a long tete-a-tete, -tete, and I was not only pleased, but really instructed. I never heard a more fluent talker or a man of greater general information. With becoming modesty, he forbore nevertheless to touch upon the theme I had just then most at heart, I mean the mysterious circumstances attending the Bugaboo War, and on my own part, what I conceive to be a proper sense of delicacy forbade me to broach this subject. Although, in truth, I was exceedingly tempted to do so, I perceived, too, that the gallant soldier preferred topics of philosophical interest, and that he delighted especially in commenting upon the rapid march of mechanical invention. Indeed, lead him where I would, this was a point to which he invariably came back. There is nothing at all like it, he would say. We are a wonderful people, and live in a wonderful age. Parachutes and railroads, man traps and spring guns, or steamboats are upon every sea, and the Nassau balloon packet is about to run regular trips, fare either way only twenty pounds sterling, between London and Timbuktu. And who shall calculate the immense influence upon social life, upon arts, upon commerce, upon literature? which will be the immediate result of the great principles of electromagnetics. Nor is this all, let me assure you. There is really no end to the march of invention. The most wonderful, the most ingenious, and let me add Mr... Mr. Thompson, I believe, is your name. Let me add, I say the most useful, the most truly useful mechanical contrivances are daily springing up like mushrooms, if I may so express myself, or more figuratively like uh, grasshoppers, like grasshoppers, Mr. Thompson, about us and uh, uh, around us. Thompson, to be sure, is not my name. But it is needless to say that I left General Smith with a heightened interest in the man, with an exalted opinion of his conversational powers, and a deep sense of the valuable privileges we enjoy in living in this age of mechanical invention. My curiosity, however, had not been altogether satisfied, and I resolved to prosecute immediate inquiry among my acquaintances touching the brevet brigadier general himself and particularly respecting the tremendous events quorum pars magna fuit during the Bugaboo and Kickapoo campaign. The first opportunity which presented itself, 
and which Horesco reference I did not in the least scruple to seize, occurred at the church of the Reverend Dr. Drummamup, where I found myself established one Sunday, just at sermon time, not only in the pew, but by the side of that worthy and communicative little friend of mine, Miss Tabitha T. Thus seated, I congratulated myself, and with much reason, upon the very flattering state of affairs. If any person knew anything about Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith, that person, it was clear to me, was Miss Tabitha T. We telegraphed a few signals, and then commenced sotto voce, a brisk tete-a-tete. -tete. Smith, said she, in reply to my very earnest inquiry. Smith? Why, not General John A.B.C.? Bless me, I thought you knew all about him. This is a wonderfully inventive age. Horrid affair, that. A bloody set of wretches, those kickapoos. Fought like a hero. Prodigies of valor. Immortal renown. Smith. Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Why, you know, he's the man. Men. Here broke in Dr. Drummamup, at the top of his voice, and with a thump that came near knocking the pulpit about our ears. Man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. I started to the extremity of the pew and perceived by the animated looks of the divine that the wrath which had nearly proved fatal to the pulpit had been excited by the whispers of the lady and myself. There was no help for it, so I submitted with a good grace and listened in all the martyrdom of dignified silence to the balance of that very capital discourse. Next evening found me a somewhat late visitor at the Rantipole Theatre, where I felt sure of satisfying my curiosity at once by merely stepping into the box of those exquisite specimens of affability and omniscience, the Misses Arabella and Miranda Cognoscenti. That fine tragedian, Climax, was doing Iago to a very crowded house, and I experienced some little difficulty in making my wishes understood, especially as our box was next to the slips, and completely overlooked the stage. Smith! said Miss Arabella, as she at length comprehended the purport of my query. Smith? Why, not General John A.B.C.? Smith? inquired Miranda musingly. God bless me! Did you ever behold a finer figure? Never, madam. But do tell me. Oh, so inimitable grace! Never, upon my word. But pray inform me. Also just an appreciation of stage effect. Madam. Or a more delicate sense of the true beauties of Shakespeare. Be so good as to look at that leg. The devil. And I turned again to her sister. Smith, said she. Why not General John A.B.C.? Horrid affair that, wasn't it? Great wretches, those boogaboos. Savage and so on. But we live in a wonderfully inventive age. Smith, oh yes, great man, perfect desperado, immortal renown, prodigies of valor, never hurt. This was given in a scream. Bless my soul, why, he's the man. Mandragora. Nor all the drowsy syrups of the world shall ever medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou oudst yesterday. Here roared out Climax just in my ear, and shaking his fist in my face all the time in a way that I couldn't stand, and I wouldn't. I left the Mrs. Cognoscenti immediately, went behind the scenes forthwith, and gave the beggarly scoundrel such a trashing as I trust he will remember to the day of his death. 
at the soiree of the lovely widow, Miss Kathleen O'Trump, I was confident that I should meet with no similar disappointment. Accordingly, I was no sooner seated at the card table with my pretty hostess for a vis-a-vis -vis, than I propounded those questions, the solution of which had become a matter so essential to my peace. Smith, said my partner, why not General John ABC? Horrid affair that, wasn't it? Diamonds, did you say? Terrible wretches, those kickapoos. We are playing whist, if you please, Mr. Tettle. However, this is the age of invention. Most certainly the age, one may say. The age par excellence. Speak French? Oh, quite a hero. Perfect desperado. No hearts, Mr. Tuttle. I don't believe it. Immortal renown and all that. Prodigies of valor. Never hurt. Why, bless me, he's the man. Men? Captain Men? Here screamed some little feminine interloper from the farthest corner of the room. Are you talking about Captain Men and the duel? Oh, I must hear. Do tell. Go on, Mrs. O'Trump. Do now go on. And go on, Miss O'Trump did. All about a certain Captain Men, who was either shot or hung, or should have been both shot and hung. Yes, Mrs. O'Trump, she went on, and I, I went off. There was no chance of hearing anything farther that evening in regard to Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith. Still I consoled myself with the reflection that the tide of ill luck would not run against me forever, and so determined to make a bold push for information at the route of that bewitching little angel, the graceful Mrs. Pirouette. Smith? said Mrs. P. as we twirled about together in a pas de sephir. Smith? Why, not General John A.B.C.? Dreadful business, that of the Boogaboos, wasn't it? Dreadful creatures, those Indians. Do turn out your toes. I really am ashamed of you. Man of great courage, poor fellow. But this is a wonderful age for invention. Oh, dear me. I'm out of breath. Quite a desperado. Prodigies of valor. Never heard? Can't believe it. I shall have to sit down and enlighten you. Smith, why, he's the man. Man Fred, I tell you. Here bowed out Miss Bableu, as I led Mrs. Pirouette to a seat. Did ever anybody hear the like? It's Man Fred, I say and not at all by any means Man Friday. Here Miss Bableu beckoned to me in a very peremptory manner, and I was obliged, will I nil I, to leave Mrs. P. for the purpose of deciding a dispute touching the title of a certain poetical drama of Lord Byron's. Although I pronounced with great promptness that the true title was Man Friday and not by any means Man Fred, Yet when I returned to seek Mrs. Pirouet, she was not to be discovered, and I made my retreat from the house in a very bitter spirit of animosity against the whole race of the Bableu. Matters had now assumed a really serious aspect, and I resolved to call at once upon my particular friend, Mr. Theodore Sinivate, for I knew that here at least I should get something like definite information. Smith! said he in his well-known peculiar way of drawling out his syllables. Smith, why not General John A.B.C.? Savage affair that with the kickapoos, wasn't it? Say, don't you think so? Perfect desperado, great pity, pon my honor. Wonderfully inventive age, prodigies of valor. By the by, did you ever hear about Captain Man? Captain Manbead, said I, please to go on with your story. Hmm, oh well, quite la même chose, as we say in France. 
Smith A, Brigadier General John A. B. C. I say... Here Mr. S. thought proper to put his finger to the side of his nose. I say, you don't mean to insinuate now, really and truly and conscientiously, that you don't know all about that affair of Smith's, as well as I do, eh? Smith! John ABC! Why, bless me, he's the man! Mr. Sinivet, said I imploringly, is he the man in the mask? No, said he, looking wise. Nor the man in the moon. This reply I considered a pointed and positive insult, and so left the house at once in high dudgeon, with a firm resolve to call my friend Mr. Sinivet to a speedy account for his ungentlemanly conduct and ill-breeding. In the meantime, however, I had no notion of being thwarted touching the information I desired. There was one resource left me yet. I would go to the fountainhead. I would call forthwith upon the general himself and demand, in explicit terms, a solution of this abominable piece of mystery. Here, at least, there should be no chance for equivocation. I would be plain, positive, peremptory, as short as pie crust, as concise as Tacitus or Montesquieu. It was early when I called, and the general was dressing. But I pleaded urgent business, and was shown at once into his bedroom by an old negro valet, who remained in attendance during my visit. As I entered the chamber, I looked about, of course, for the occupant, but did not immediately perceive him. There was a large and exceedingly odd-looking bundle of something which lay close by my feet on the floor, and as I was not in the best humor in the world, I gave it a kick out of the way. Hem, ahem, rather civil that, I should say, said the bundle, in one of the smallest and altogether the funniest little voices, between a squeak and a whistle that I ever heard in all the days of my existence. Ahem, rather civil that I should observe. I fairly shouted with terror and made off at a tangent into the farthest extremity of the room. God bless me, my dear fellow. Here again whistled the bundle. What, 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 why, what is the matter? I really believe you don't know me at all. What could I say to all this? What could I? I staggered into an armchair and, with staring eyes and open mouth, awaited the solution of the wonder. Strange you shouldn't know me, though, isn't it? presently re-squeaked the nondescript, which I now perceived was performing upon the floor some inexplicable evolution, very analogous to the drawing on of a stocking. There was only a single leg, however, apparent. Strange you shouldn't know me, though, isn't it? Pompey, bring me that leg! Here Pompey handed the bundle a very capital cork leg, already dressed, which it screwed on in a trice, and then it stood up before my eyes. And a bloody action it was, continued the thing, as if in a soliloquy. But then one mustn't fight with the boogaboos and kickapoos, and think of coming off with a mere scratch. Pompey, I'll thank you now for that arm. Thomas, turning to me, is decidedly the best hand at a cork leg. But if you should ever want an arm, my dear fellow, you must really let me recommend you to Bishop. Here Pompey screwed on an arm. We had rather hot work of it, that you may say, Now, you dog, slip on my shoulders and bosom. Petit makes the best shoulders, but for a bosom you will have to go to Ducro. Bosom, said I. Pompey, will you never be ready with that wig? 
Scalping is a rough process after all. But then you can procure such a capital scratch at Delorme's. Scratch. Now you nigger my teeth. For a good set of these, you had better go to Parmley's at once. High prices, but excellent work. I swallowed some very capital articles, though, when the big boogaboo rammed me down with the butt end of his rifle. Butt end rammed down my eye. Oh, yes. By the by, my eye, here. Pompey, you scamp, screw it in. Those kickapoos are not so very slow at a gouge. But he's a belight man, that Dr. Williams. After all, you can't imagine how well I see with the eyes of his make. I now began very clearly to perceive that the object before me was nothing more nor less than my new acquaintance, Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith. The manipulations of Pompey had made, I must confess, a very striking difference in the appearance of the personal man. The voice, however, still puzzled me no little, but even this apparent mystery was speedily cleared up. Pompey, you black rascal! squeaked the general. I really do believe you would let me go out without my pallet. Hereupon, the negro, grumbling out an apology, went up to his master, opened his mouth with the knowing air of a horse jockey, and adjusted therein a somewhat singular-looking machine in a very dexterous manner that I could not altogether comprehend. The alteration, however, in the entire expression of the general's countenance was instantaneous and surprising. When he again spoke, his voice had resumed all the rich melody and strength which I had noticed upon our original introduction. Damn the vagabonds, said he in so clear a tone that I positively started at the change. Damn the vagabonds, they not only knocked in the roof of my mouth, but took the trouble to cut off at least seven-eighths of my tongue. There isn't Bonfanti's equal, however, in America, for really good articles of this description. I can recommend you to him with confidence. Here the general bowed. And assure you that I have the greatest pleasure in so doing. I acknowledged his kindness in my best manner, and took leave of him at once, with a perfect understanding of the true state of affairs with a full comprehension of the mystery which had troubled me so long. It was evident. It was a clear case. Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith was the man, was the man that was used up. End of section 15. Recording by Wupper Hippo. Section 16 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Businessman by Edgar Allan Poe Method is the soul of business, old saying. I am a businessman. I am a methodical man. Method is the thing, after all. But there are no people I more heartily despise than your eccentric fools who prate about method without understanding it, attending strictly to its letter and violating its spirit. These fellows are always doing the most out-of-the-way things in what they call an orderly manner. Now here I conceive as a positive paradox. True method appertains to the ordinary and the obvious alone, and cannot be applied to the outre. 
What definite idea can a body attach to such expressions as methodical jack o dandy or a systematical will o' the wisp? My notions upon this head might not have been so clear as they are, but for a fortunate accident which happened to me when I was a very little boy. A good hearted old Irish nurse, whom I shall not forget in my will, took me up one day by the heels when I was making more noise than was necessary, and swinging me round two or three times, damned my ears for a screeching little salpain, and then knocked my head into a cocked hat against the bedpost. This, I say, decided my fate, and made my fortune. A bump arose at once on my sinciput, and turned out to be as pretty an organ of order as one shall see on a summer's day. Hence that positive appetite for system and regularity which has made me the distinguished man of business that I am. If there is anything on earth I hate, it is a genius. Your geniuses are all arrant asses. The greater the genius, the greater the ass, and to this rule there is no exception whatever. Especially, you cannot make a man of business out of a genius, any more than money out of a Jew, or the best nutmegs out of pine knots. The creatures are always going off at a tangent into some fantastic employment or ridiculous speculation entirely at variance with the fitness of things and having no business whatever to be considered as a business at all. Thus, you may tell these characters immediately by the nature of their occupations. If you ever perceive a man setting up as a merchant or a manufacturer, or going into the cotton or tobacco trade or any of these eccentric pursuits, or getting to be a dry goods dealer or soap boiler or something of that kind, or pretending to be a lawyer or a blacksmith or a physician, anything out of the usual way, you may set him down at once as a genius, and then, according to the rule of three, he's an ass. Now, I am not in any respect a genius, but a regular businessman. My daybook and ledger will evidence this in a minute. They are well kept, though I say it myself, and in my general habits of accuracy and punctuality I am not to be beat by a clock. Moreover, my occupations have been always made to chime in with the ordinary habitudes of my fellow men. Not that I feel the least indebted upon this score to my exceedingly weak-minded parents, who, beyond doubt, would have made an arrant genius of me at last if my guardian angel had not come in good time to the rescue. In biography the truth is everything, and in autobiography it is especially so. Yet I scarcely hope to be believed when I state, however solemnly, that my poor father put me, when I was about fifteen years of age, into the counting-house of what he termed a respectable hardware and commission merchant doing a capital bit of business. A capital bit of fiddlestick! However, the consequence of this folly was that in two or three days I had to be sent home to my button-headed family in a high state of fever, and with a most violent and dangerous pain in the since put all around about my organ of order. It was nearly a gone case with me then, just touch and go for six weeks, the physicians giving me up and all that sort of thing. But, although I suffered much, I was a thankful boy in the main. I was saved from being a respectable hardware and commission merchant doing a capital bit of business, and I felt grateful to the protuberance which had been the means of my salvation, as well as to the kind-hearted female who had originally put these means within my reach. The most of boys run away from home at ten or twelve years of age, but I waited till I was sixteen. I don't know that I should have gone even then, if I had not happened to hear my old mother talk about setting me up on my own hook in the grocery way. The grocery way! Only think of that! I resolved to be off forthwith and try and establish myself in some decent occupation without dancing attendance any longer upon the caprices of these eccentric old people and running the risk of being made a genius of in the end. In this project I succeeded perfectly well at the first effort, and by the time I was fairly eighteen 
found myself doing an extensive and profitable business in the tailor's walking advertisement line. I was enabled to discharge the onerous duties of this profession only by that rigid adherence to system which formed the leading feature of my mind. A scrupulous method characterized my actions as well as my accounts. In my case, it was method, not money, which made the man. At least all of him that was not made by the tailor whom I served. At nine every morning I called upon that individual for the clothes of the day. Ten o'clock found me in some fashionable promenade or other place of public amusement. The precise regularity with which I turned my handsome person about, so as to bring successively to view every position of the suit upon my back, was the admiration of all the knowing men in the trade. Noon never passed without me bringing home a customer to the house of my employers, Messrs. Cut and Come Again. I say this proudly, but with tears in my eyes. For the firm proved themselves the basis of ingrates. The little account about which we quarrelled and finally parted cannot in any item be thought overcharged by gentlemen really conversant with the nature of the business. Upon this point, however, I feel a degree of proud satisfaction in permitting the reader to judge for himself. My bill ran thus. <clears throat> Messrs. Cut and Come Again, Merchant Tailors, to Peter Prophet, Walking Advertiser, July the 10th, to promenade as usual and customer brought home, 25 cents, July the 11th, ditto, 25 cents, July the 12th, to One Lie, Second Class, Damaged Black Cloth, Sold for Invisible Green, 25 cents, July the 13th, to one lie, first class, extra quality and size, recommending milled satinette as a broad cloth, 75 cents. July the 20th, to purchasing brand new paper shirt collar or dicky to set of grey Petersham, 2 cents. August the 15th, to wearing double padded bobtail frock, thermometer 106 in the shade, 25 cents. August the 16th, Standing on one leg three hours to show off new style strapped pants at twelve and a half cents per leg per hour, thirty seven and a half cents. August the seventeenth to promenade as usual and large customer brought fat man fifty cents. August the eighteenth ditto medium size twenty five cents. August the nineteenth ditto small man and bad pay six cents. Total two dollars ninety five and a half cents. The item chiefly disputed in this bill was the very moderate charge of two pennies for the dicky. Upon my word of honour, this was not an unreasonable price for that dicky. It was one of the cleanest and prettiest little dickies I ever saw, and I have good reason to believe that it affected the sale of three Petershams. The elder partner of the firm, however, would allow me only one penny of the charge, and took it upon himself to show in what manner four of the same size conveniences could be got out of a sheet of full scap. But it is needless to say that I stood upon the principle of the thing. Business is business, and should be done in a business way. There was no system whatever in swindling me out of a penny. A clear fraud of fifty per cent. No method in any respect. I left at once the employment of Messrs. Cut and Come Again, and set up in the eyesore line, by myself, one of the most lucrative, respectable, and independent of the ordinary occupations. My strict integrity, economy, and rigorous business habits here again came into play. I found myself driving a flourishing trade, and soon became a marked man upon change. The truth is, I never dabbled in flashy matters, but jogged on in the good old sober routine of the calling, a calling in which I should no doubt have remained to the present hour, but for a little accident which happened to me in the prosecution of one of the usual business operations of the profession. Whenever a rich old hunks or prodigal heir or bankrupt corporation gets into the notion of putting up a palace, there is no such thing in the world as stopping either of them, and this every intelligent person knows. The fact in question is indeed the basis of the eyesore trade. As soon, therefore, as a building project is fairly afoot by one of these parties, 
We merchants secure a nice corner of the lot in contemplation, or a prime little situation just adjoining, or right in front. This done, we wait until the palace is halfway up, and then we pay some tasty architect to run us up an ornamental mud hovel, right against it, or a down east, or Dutch pagoda, or a pigsty, or an ingenious little bit of fancy work, either Eskimo, Kickapoo, or Hottentot. Of course, we can't afford to take these structures down under a bonus of 500% upon the prime cost of our lot and plaster. Can we? I ask the question. I ask it of businessmen. It would be irrational to suppose that we can. And yet there was a rascally corporation which asked me to do this very thing. This very thing. I did not reply to their absurd proposition, of course, but I felt it a duty to go that same night and lamp-black the whole of their palace. For this, the unreasonable villains clapped me into jail, and the gentlemen of the ISIL trade could not well avoid cutting my connection when I came out. The assault and battery business into which I was now forced to adventure for a livelihood was somewhat ill-adapted to the delicate nature of my constitution, but I went to work in it with a good heart, and found my account here, as heretofore, in these stern habits of methodical accuracy, which have been thumped into me by that delightful old nurse. I would indeed be the basest of men not to remember her well in my will. By observing, as I say, the strictest system in all my dealings, and keeping a well-regulated set of books, I was enabled to get over many serious difficulties, and in the end to establish myself very decently in the profession. The truth is that few individuals in any line did a snugger little business than I. I will just copy a page or so out of my day-book, and this will save me the necessity of blowing my own trumpet, a contemptible practice of which no high-minded man will be guilty. Now the day-book is a thing that don't lie. January the 1st, New Year's Day. Met Snap in the street, groggy. Memo, he'll do. Met Gruff shortly afterwards, blind drunk. Memo, he'll answer too. Entered both gentlemen into my ledger and opened a running account with each. January the 2nd. Saw Snap at the exchange and went up and trod on his toe. Doubled his fists and knocked me down. Good. Got up again. Some trifling difficulty with Bag, my attorney. I want the damages at a thousand, but he says that for so simple a knockdown we can't lay them at more than five hundred. Memo must get rid of Bag. No system at all. January the 3rd. Went to the theatre to look for Gruff. Saw him sitting in a side box in the second tier between a fat lady and a lean one. Quizzed the whole party through an opera glass till I saw the fat lady blush and whisper to G. Went round then into the box, put my nose within reach of his hand, wouldn't pull it, no go. Blew it and tried again, no go. Sat down then and winked at the lean lady when I had the high satisfaction of finding him lift me up by the nape of the neck and fling me over the pit. Neck dislocated and right leg capitally splintered. Went home in high glee, drank a bottle of champagne, and booked the young man for five thousand. Bag says it'll do. February the 15th, compromised the case of Mr. Snap, amount entered in journal, fifty cents, which see. February the 16th, cast by that ruffian gruff who made me a present of five dollars, costs of suit, four dollars and twenty-five cents, net profit, see journal, seventy-five cents. Now here is a clear gain in a very brief period of no less than one dollar and twenty-five cents. This is in the mere case of Snap and Gruff, and I solemnly assure the reader that these extracts are taken at random from my day book. It's an old saying, and a true one, however, that money is nothing in comparison with health. I found the exactions of the profession somewhat too much for my delicate state of body, and discovering at last that I was knocked all out of shape, so that I didn't know very well what to make of the matter, and so that my friends, or when they met me in the street, couldn't tell that I was Peter Prophet at all, it occurred to me that the best expedient I could adopt was to alter my line of business. I turned my attention, therefore, to mud-dabbling, and continued it 
for some years. The worst of this occupation is that too many people take a fancy to it, and the competition is in consequence excessive. Every ignoramus of a fellow who finds that he hasn't brains in sufficient quantity to make his way as a walking advertiser, or an eyesore prig, or a salt and batter man, thinks, of course, that he'll answer very well as a dabbler of mud. But there never was entertained a more erroneous idea than that it requires no brains to mud dabble. Especially, there is nothing to be made in this way without method. I did only a retail business myself, but my old habits of system carried me swimmingly along. I selected my street crossing, in the first place, with great deliberation, and I never put down a broom in any other part of town but that. I took care, too, to have a nice little puddle at hand, which I could get at in a minute. And by these means, I got to be well known as a man to be trusted, and this is one half the battle, let me tell you, in trade. Nobody ever failed to pitch me a copper, and got over my crossing with a clean pair of pantaloons. And as my business habits in this respect were sufficiently understood, I never met with any attempt at imposition. I wouldn't have put up with it if I had. Never imposing upon anyone myself, I suffered no one to play the possum with me. The frauds of the banks, of course, I couldn't help. Their suspension put me to ruinous inconvenience. These, however, are not individuals but corporations, and corporations, it is very well known, have neither bodies to be kicked nor souls to be damned. I was making money at this business when, in an evil moment, I was induced to merge in that core spattering, a somewhat analogous but by no means so respectable a profession. My location, to be sure, was an excellent one, being central, and I had capital blacking and brushes. My little dog, too, was quite fat and up to all varieties of snuff. He had been in the trade a long time, and I may say understood it. Our general routine was this. Pompey, having rolled himself well in the mud, sat upon end at the shop door, until he observed a dandy approaching in bright boots. He then proceeded to meet him, and gave the Wellingtons a rub or two with his wool. Then the dandy swore very much, and looked about for a boot black. There I was, full in his view with blacking and brushes. It was only a minute's work, and then came a sixpence. This did moderately well for a time. In fact, I was not avaricious, but my dog was. I allowed him a third of the profit, but he was advised to insist upon half. This I couldn't stand. So we quarrelled and parted. I next tried my hand at the organ grinding for a while, and may say that I made out pretty well. It is a plain, straightforward business, and requires no particular abilities. You can get a music mill for a mere song, and to put it in order, you have but to open the works and give them three or four smart raps with a hammer. It improves the tone of the thing, for business purposes, more than you can imagine. This done, you have only to stroll along with the mill on your back until you see tan bark in the street and a knocker wrapped up in buckskin. Then you stop and grind, looking as if you meant to stop and grind till doomsday. Presently a window opens, and somebody pitches you a sixpence with a request to uh, hush up and go on, etc. I am aware that some grinders have actually afforded to go on for this sum, but for my part I found the necessary outlay of capital too great to permit of my going on under a shilling. At this occupation I did a good deal, but somehow I was not quite satisfied, and so finally abandoned it. The truth is... I laboured under the disadvantage of having no monkey, and American streets are so muddy, and a democratic rabble is so obtrusive and so full of demnition mischievous little boys. I was now out of employment for some months, but at length succeeded by dint of great interest in procuring a situation in the sham post. The duties here are simple and not altogether unprofitable, for example. Very early in the morning I had to make up my packet of sham letters. Upon the inside of each of these I had to scrawl a few lines on any subject which occurred to me as sufficiently mysterious, signing all the epistles, Tom Dobson or, or Bobby Tompkins, or anything in that way. Having folded and sealed all and stamped them with sham postmarks, New Orleans, Bengal, Botany Bay, or any other place a great way off, I set out forthwith upon my daily routine, as if in a great hurry. I always called at the big houses to deliver the letters and receive the postage. Nobody hesitates at paying for a letter, especially for a double one. People are such fools. 
and it was no trouble to get around the corner before there was time to open the epistles. The worst of this profession was that I had to walk so much, and so fast, and so frequently to vary my route. Besides, I had serious scruples of conscience. I can't bear to hear innocent individuals abused, and the way the whole town took to cursing Tom Dobson and Bobby Tompkins was really awful to hear. I washed my hands of the matter in disgust. My eighth and last speculation has been in the cat-growing way. I have found this a most pleasant and lucrative business, and really no trouble at all. The country, it is well known, has become infested with cats, so much so of late, that a petition for relief most numerously and respectably signed was brought before the legislature at its last memorable session. The assembly at this epoch was unusually well informed, and having passed many other wise and wholesome enactments, it crowned all with the Cat Act. In its original form, this law offered a premium for cat heads, fourpence apiece, uh, but the Senate succeeded in amending the main clause so as to substitute the word tails for heads. This amendment was so obviously proper that the House concurred in it nem com. As soon as the Governor had signed the bill, I invested my whole estate in the purchase of Toms and Tabbies. At first, I could only afford to feed them upon mice, which are cheap, but they fulfilled the scriptural injunction at so marvellous a rate that I at length considered it my best policy to be liberal, and so indulged them in oysters and turtle. Their tails, at a legislative price, now bring me in a good income, for I have discovered a way in which, by means of macassar oil, I can force three crops in a year. It delights me to find, too, that the animals soon get accustomed to the thing, and would rather have the appendages cut off than otherwise. I consider myself, therefore, a made man, and am bargaining for a country seat on the Hudson. End of section 16. Recording by Joseph Finkberg. Section 17 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shantae Elliott. The Landscape Garden by Edgar Allan Poe. The garden like a lady fair was cut that lay as if she slumbered in delight, and to the open skies her eyes did shut. The azure fields of heaven were assembled right in a large round set with flowers of light. The flowers de loose and the round sparks of dew that hung upon their azure leaves did show like twinkling stars that sparkle in the evening blue. Giles Fletcher No more remarkable man ever lived than my friend, the young Ellison. He was remarkable in the entire and continuous profusion of good gifts ever lavished upon him by fortune. From his cradle to his grave, a gale of the blandest prosperity bore him along. Nor do I use the word prosperity in its mere worldly or external sense. I mean it as synonymous with happiness. The person of whom I speak seemed born for the purpose of foreshadowing the wild doctrines of Tegro, Price, Priestley, and Condorcet, of exemplifying, by individual instance, what has been deemed the mere chimera of the perfectionists, in the brief existence of Ellison, I fancy that I have seen refuted the dogma that in man's physical and spiritual nature lies some hidden principle, the antagonist of bliss. An intimate and anxious examination of his career has taught me to understand that, in general, from the violation of a few simple laws of humanity arises the wretchedness of mankind. That, as a species, we have in our possession the as yet unwrought elements of content, and that even now, in the present blindness and darkness of all idea on the great question of the social condition, it is not impossible that man, the individual, under certain unusual and highly fortuitous conditions, may be happy. With opinions such as these was my young friend fully imbued. 
and thus is it especially worthy of observation that the uninterrupted enjoyment which distinguished his life was in great part the result of preconcert. It is indeed evident that with less of the instinctive philosophy which now and then stands so well in the stead of experience, Mr. Ellison would have found himself precipitated by the very extraordinary successes of his life into the common vortex of unhappiness which yawns for those of preeminent endowments. But it is by no means my present object to pen an essay on happiness. The ideas of my friend may be summed up in a few words. He admitted but four unvarying laws, or rather elementary principles, of bliss. That which he considered chief was, strange to say, the simple and purely physical one of free exercise in the open air. The health, he said, attainable by other means than this is scarcely worth the name. He pointed to the tillers of the earth, the only people who, as a class, are proverbially more happy than others. And then he instanced the high ecstasies of the fox hunter. His second principle was the love of woman. His third, the contempt of ambition. His fourth was an object of unceasing pursuit. And he held that, other things being equal, the extent of happiness was proportioned to the spirituality of this object. I have said that Ellison was remarkable in the continuous profusion of good gifts lavished upon him by fortune. In personal grace and beauty he exceeded all men. His intellect was of that order to which the attainment of knowledge is less a labor than a necessity and an intuition. His family was one of the most illustrious of the empire. His bride was the loveliest and most devoted of women. His possessions had been always ample, but upon the attainment of his one-and-twentieth year, it was discovered that one of those extraordinary freaks of fate had been played in his behalf which startled the whole social world amid which they occur, and seldom fell radically to alter the entire moral constitution of those who are their objects. It appears that about one hundred years prior to Mr. Ellison's attainment of his majority, there had died, in a remote province, one Mr. Seabright Ellison. This gentleman had amassed a princely fortune, and, having no very immediate connections, conceived the whim of suffering his wealth to accumulate for a century after his decease. Minutely and sagaciously directing the various modes of investment, he bequeathed the aggregate amount to the nearest of blood, bearing the name Ellison, who should be alive at the end of a hundred years. Many futile attempts had been made to set aside the singular bequest, their ex post facto character rendered them abortive. But the attention of a jealous government was aroused, and a decree finally obtained, forbidding all similar accumulations. This act did not prevent young Ellison, upon his twenty-first birthday, from entering into possession as the heir of his ancestor, Seabright, of a fortune of four hundred and fifty millions of dollars. When it had become definitely known that such was the enormous wealth inherited, there were, of course, many speculations as to the mode of its disposal. The gigantic magnitude and the immediately available nature of the sum dazzled and bewildered all who thought upon the topic. The possessor of any appreciable amount of money might have been imagined to perform any one of a thousand things. With riches merely surpassing those of any citizen, it would have been easy to suppose him engaging to supreme excess in the fashionable extravagances of his time, or busying himself with political intrigue, or aiming at ministerial power, or purchasing increase of nobility or devising gorgeous architectural piles, or collecting large specimens of virtue, or playing the munificent patron of letters and art, or endowing and bestowing his name upon extensive institutions of charity. But, 
for the inconceivable wealth in the actual possession of the young heir, these objects and all ordinary objects were felt to be inadequate. Recourse was had to figures, and figures but sufficed to confound. It was seen that even at 3%, the annual income of the inheritance amounted to no less than $13 million and $500,000 which was one million and one hundred and twenty five thousand per month or thirty six thousand nine hundred and eighty six per day or one thousand five hundred and forty one per hour or six and twenty dollars for every minute that flew thus the usual track of supposition was thoroughly broken up men knew not what to imagine there were some who even conceived that Mr. Ellison would divest himself forthwith at, at least two-thirds of his fortune as of utterly superfluous opulence, enriching whole troops of his relatives by division of his superabundance. I was not surprised, however, to perceive that he had long made up his mind upon a topic which had occasioned so much of discussion to his friends. Nor was I greatly astonished at the nature of his decision. In the widest and noblest sense, he was a poet. He comprehended, moreover, the true character, the august aims, the supreme majesty and dignity of the poetic sentiment, the proper gratification of the sentiment he instinctively felt to lie in the creation of novel forms of beauty. Some peculiarities, either in his early education or in the nature of his intellect, had tinged with what is termed materialism the whole cast of his ethical speculations. And it was this bias, perhaps, which imperceptibly led him to perceive that the most advantageous, if not the sole legitimate field for the exercise of the poetic sentiment, was to be found in the creation of novel moves of purely physical loveliness. Thus it happened that he became neither musician nor poet, if we use this latter term in its everyday acceptation. Or it might have been that he became neither the one nor the other, in pursuance of an idea of his which I have already mentioned, the idea that in the contempt of ambition lay one of the essential principles of happiness on earth. Is it not, indeed, possible that while a high order of genius is necessarily ambitious, the highest is invariably above that which is termed ambition? And may it not thus happen that many far greater than Milton have contentedly remained mute and inglorious? I believe the world has never yet seen in that, unless through some series of accidents goading the noblest order of mind into distasteful exertion, the world will never behold that full extent of triumphant execution in the richer productions of art of which the human nature is absolutely capable. Mr. Ellison became neither musician nor poet. Although no man lived more profoundly enamored both of music and the muse. Under other circumstances than those which invested him, it is not impossible that he would have become a painter. The field of sculpture, although in its nature rigidly political, was too limited in its extent and in its consequences to have occupied at any time much of his attention and i have now mentioned all the provinces in which even the most liberal understanding of the poetic sentiment has declared this sentiment capable of expatiating i mean the most liberal public and recognized conception of the idea involved in the phrase poetic sentiment but Mr. Ellison imagined that the richest and altogether the most natural and most suitable province had been blindedly neglected. No definition had spoken of the landscape gardener as of the poet, yet my friend could not fail to perceive that the creation of the landscape garden offered to the true muse the most magnificent of opportunities. Here was, indeed, the fairest field for the display of invention or imagination in the endless combining of forms of novel beauty the elements which should enter into combination being at all times 
and by vast superiority, the most glorious which the earth could afford. In the multiform of the tree, and in the multicolor of the flower, he recognized the most direct and the most energetic efforts of nature at physical loveliness. And in the direction or concentration of this effort, or, still more properly, in its adaptation to the eyes which were to behold it upon earth, he perceived that he should be employing the best means, laboring to the greatest advantage, in the fulfillment of his destiny as poet. Its adaptation to the eyes which were to behold it upon earth. In his explanation of this phraseology, Mr. Ellison did much towards solving what has always seemed to me an enigma. I mean the fact, which none but the ignorant dispute, that no such combinations of scenery exist in nature as the painter of genius has in his power to produce. No such paradises are to be found in reality as have glowed upon the canvases of Claude. In the most enchanting of natural landscapes, there will always be found a defect or an excess many excesses and defects. While the component parts may exceed individually the highest skill of the artist, the arrangement of the parts will always be susceptible of improvement. In short, no position can be attained from which an artistical eye, looking steadily, will not find matter of offense in what is technically termed the composition of a natural landscape. And yet, how unintelligible is this? In all other matters, we are justly instructed to regard nature as supreme. With her details, we shrink from competition. Who shall presume to imitate the color of the tulip, or to improve the proportions of the lily of the valley? The criticism which says, of sculpture or of portraiture, that nature is to be exalted rather than imitated, is in error. No pictorial or sculptural combinations of points of human loveliness do more than approach the living and breathing human beauty as it gladdens our daily path. Byron, who often erred, erred not in saying, I've seen more living beauty, ripe and real, than all the nonsense of their stone ideal. And landscape alone is the principle of the critic's true. And, having felt its truth here, it is but the headlong spirit of generalization which has induced him to pronounce it true throughout all the domains of art. Having, I say, felt its truth here. For the feeling is no affectation or chimera. The mathematics afford no more absolute demonstrators than the sentiment of his art yields to the artist. He not only believes but positively knows that such and such apparently arbitrary arrangements of matter or form constitute and alone constitute the true beauty. Yet his reasons have not yet been matured into expression. It remains for a more profound analysis than the world has yet seen, fully to investigate and express them. Nevertheless, he is he confirmed in his instinctive opinions by the concurrence of all his compeers. Let a composition be defective. Let an emendation be wrought in its mere arrangement of form. Let this emendation be submitted to every artist in the world. By each will its necessity be admitted. And even far more than this, in remedy of the defective composition, each insulated member of the fraternity will suggest the identical emendation. I repeat that in landscape arrangements or collocations alone is the physical nature susceptible of exaltation and that, therefore, her susceptibility of improvement at this one point was a mystery which hitherto I had been unable to solve. It was Mr. Ellison who first suggested the idea that what we regarded as improvement or exaltation of the natural beauty was really such as respected only in the mortal or human point of view, that each alteration or disturbance of the primitive scenery might possibly affect a blemish in the picture, 
if we could suppose this picture viewed at large from some remote point in the heavens. It is easily understood, said Mr. Ellison, that what might improve a closely scrutinized detail might, at the same time, injure a general and more distantly observed effect. He spoke upon this topic with warmth, regarding not so much its immediate or obvious importance, which is little, as the character of the conclusions to which it might lead, or of the collateral propositions which it might serve to corroborate or sustain. There might be a class of beings, human once, but now to humanity invisible, for whose scrutiny and for whose refined appreciation of the beautiful, more especially than for our own, had been set in order by God, the great landscape garden of the whole earth. In the course of our discussion, my young friend took occasion to quote some passages from a writer who has been supposed to have well treated this theme. There are, properly, he writes, but two styles of landscape gardening, the natural and the artificial. One seeks to recall the original beauty of the country by adapting its means to the surrounding scenery, cultivating trees in harmony with the hills or plain of the neighboring land, detecting and bringing into practice those nice relations of size, proportion, and color which, hid from the common observer, are revealed everywhere to the experienced student of nature. The result of the natural style of gardening is seen rather in the absence of all defects and incongruities, in the prevalence of a beautiful harmony and order than in the creation of any special wonders or miracles. The artificial style has as many varieties as there are different tastes to gratify. It has a certain general relation to the various styles of building. There are the stately avenues and retirements of Versailles, Italian terraces, and a various mixed Old English style, which bears some relation to the domestic Gothic or English Elizabethan architecture. Whatever may be said against the abuses of the artificial landscape gardening, a mixture of pure art in the garden scene adds to it a great beauty. This is partly pleasing to the eye by the show of order and design and partly moral. A terrace with an old moss-covered balustrade calls up at once to the eye the fair forms that have passed there in other days. The slightest exhibition of art is an evidence of care and human interest. From what I have already observed, said Mr. Ellison, you will understand that I reject the idea here expressed of recalling the original beauty of the country. The original beauty is never so great as that which may be introduced. Of course, much depends upon the selection of a spot with capabilities. What is said in respect to the detecting and bringing into practice those nice relations of size, proportion, and color is a mere vagueness of speech, which may mean much or little or nothing, and which guides in no degree. That the true result of the natural style of gardening is seen rather in the absence of all defects and incongruities than in the creation of any special wonders or miracles is a proposition better suited to the groveling apprehension of the herd than to the fervent dreams of the man of genius. The merit suggested is, at best, negative, and appertains to that hobbling criticism which, in letters, would elevate Addison into apotheosis. In truth, while that merit which consists in the mere avoiding demerit appeals directly to the understanding and can thus be foreshadowed in rule, the loftier merit, which breathes in flames in invention or creation, can be apprehended solely in its results. 
Rule applies but to the excellences of avoidance, to the virtues which deny or refrain. Beyond these, the critical art can but suggest. We may be instructed to build an odyssey, but it is in vain that we are told how to conceive a tempest, an inferno, a Prometheus bound, a nightingale, such as that of Keats, or the sensitive plant of Shelley. But the thing done, the wonder accomplished, the capacity for apprehension becomes universal. The sophists of the negative school, who, through inability to create, have scoffed at creation, are now found the loudest in applause. What, in its chrysalis condition of principle, affronted their demure reason, never fails in its maturity of accomplishment to exhort admiration from their instinct of the beautiful or of the sublime. Our author's observation in the artificial style of gardening, continued Mr. Ellison, are less objectionable. A mixture of pure art in a garden scene adds to it a great beauty. This is just, and the reference to the sense of human interest is equally so. I repeat that the principle here expressed is incontrovertible, but there may be something even beyond it. There may be an object in full keeping with the principle suggested, an object unattainable by the means it ordinarily in possession of mankind, yet which, if attained, would lend a charm to the landscape garden immeasurably surpassing that which a merely human interest could bestow. The true poet possessed of very unusual pecuniary resources might possibly, while retaining the necessary idea of art or interest or culture, so imbue his designs at once with extent and novelty of beauty as to convey the sentiment of spiritual interference. It will be seen that, in bringing about such result, he secures all the advantages of interest or design, while relieving his work of all the harshness and technicality of art. In the most rugged of wildernesses, in the most savage of the scenes of pure nature, there is apparent the art of a creator. Yet is this art apparent only to reflection? In no respect has it the obvious force of a feeling. Now, if we imagine the sense of the Almighty designed to be harmonized in a measurable degree, if we suppose a landscape whose combined strangeness, vastness, definitiveness, and magnificence shall inspire the idea of culture or care or superintendence on the part of intelligences superior yet akin to humanity, then the sentiment of interest is preserved. While the art is made to assume the air of an intermediate or secondary nature, a nature which is not God, nor an emanation of God, but which is still nature, in the sense that it is the handiwork of the angels that hover between man and God. It was in devoting his gigantic wealth to the practical embodiment of a vision such as this, and the free exercise in the open air, which resulted from personal direction of his plans, and the continuous and unceasing object which these plans afford. In the contempt of ambition, which it enabled him more to feel than to affect, and lastly, it was in the companionship and sympathy of a devoted wife that Ellison thought to find, and found, an exemption from the ordinary cares of humanity, with a far greater amount of positive happiness than ever glowed in the rapt daydream of disdain. End of section 17. Section 18 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mazel's Chess Player by Edgar Allan Poe Perhaps no exhibition of the kind has ever elicited so general attention as the chess player of Mazel. Wherever seen, it has been an object of intense curiosity to all persons who think. Yet the question of its modus operandi is still undetermined. Nothing has been written on this topic which can be considered as decisive, and accordingly we find everywhere men of mechanical genius, of great general acuteness, and discriminative understanding who make no scruple in pronouncing the automaton a pure machine unconnected with human agency in its movements and consequently beyond all comparison the most astonishing of the inventions of mankind and such it would undoubtedly be were they right in their supposition Assuming this hypothesis, it would be grossly absurd to compare with the chess player any similar thing of either modern or ancient days. Yet there have been many and wonderful automata. In Brewster's Letters on Natural Magic, we have an account of the most remarkable. Among these may be mentioned as having beyond doubt existed firstly the coach invented by m camus for the amusement of louis the fourteenth when a child a table about four feet square was introduced into the room appropriated for the exhibition upon this table was placed a carriage six inches in length made of wood and drawn by two horses of the same material one window being down a lady was seen on the back seat a coachman held the reins on the box and a footman and page were in their places behind m camus now touched a spring whereupon the coachman smacked his whip and the horses proceeded in a natural manner along the edge of the table drawing after them the carriage having gone as far as possible in this direction a sudden turn was made to the left and the vehicle was driven at right angles to its former course and still closely along the edge of the table in this way the coach proceeded until it arrived opposite the chair of the young prince it then stopped the page descended and opened the door the lady alighted and presented a petition to her sovereign she then re-entered the page put up the steps closed the door and resumed his station the coachman whipped his horses and the carriage was driven back to its original position the magician of Monsieur Maladet is also worthy of notice. We copy the following account of it from the letters before mentioned of Dr. B., who derived his information principally from the Edinburgh Encyclopedia. One of the most popular pieces of mechanism which we have seen is the magician constructed by Monsieur Maladet for the purpose of answering certain questions. A figure dressed like a magician appears seated at the bottom of a wall holding a wand in one hand and a book in the other a number of questions ready prepared are inscribed on oval medallions and the spectator takes any one of these he chooses and to which he wishes an answer and having placed it in a drawer ready to receive it the drawer shuts with a spring till the answer is returned. The magician then arises from his seat, bows his head, describes circles with his wand, and consulting the book as if, in deep thought, he lifts it towards his face. 
having thus appeared to ponder over the proposed question he raises his wand and striking with it the wall above his head two folding doors fly open and display an appropriate answer to the question the doors again close the magician resumes his original position and the drawer opens to return the medallion there are twenty of these medallions all containing different questions to which the magician returns the most suitable and striking answers the medallions are thin plates of brass of an elliptical form exactly resembling each other some of the medallions have a question inscribed on each side both of which the magician answered in succession if the drawer is shut without a medallion being put into it the magician rises consults his book shakes his head and resumes his seat the folding doors remain shut and the drawer is returned empty if two medallions are put into the drawer together an answer is returned only to the lower one when the machinery is wound up the movements continue about an hour during which time about fifty questions may be answered the inventor stated that the means by which the different medallions acted upon the machinery so as to produce the proper answers to the questions which they contained were extremely simple the duck of vaucanson was still more remarkable it was of the size of life and so perfect an imitation of the living animal that all the spectators were deceived it executed says brewster all the natural movements and gestures it ate and drank with avidity performed all the quick motions of the head and throat which are peculiar to the duck and like it muddled the water which it drank with its bill it produced also the sound of quacking in the most natural manner in the anatomical structure the artist exhibited the highest skill every bone in the real duck had its representative in the automaton and its wings were anatomically exact every cavity apophysis and curvature was imitated and each bone executed its proper movements when corn was thrown down before it the duck stretched out its neck to pick it up swallowed and digested it but if these machines were ingenious what shall we think of the calculating machines of mr babbage what shall we think of an engine of wood and metal which can not only compute astronomical and navigational tables to any given extent but render the exactitude of its operations mathematically certain through its power of correcting its possible errors what shall we think of a machine which can not only accomplish all this but actually print off its elaborate results when obtained without the slightest intervention of the intellect of man it will perhaps be said in reply that such a machine as we have described is altogether above comparison with the chess player of Mausel. by no means it is altogether beneath it that is to say provided we assume what should never for a moment be assumed that the chess player is a pure machine and performs its operations without any immediate human agency arithmetical or algebraical calculations are from their very nature fixed and determinate certain data being given certain results necessarily and inevitably follow these results have dependence upon nothing and are influenced by nothing but the data originally given and the question to be solved proceeds or should proceed to its final determination by a succession of unerring steps liable to no change and subject to no modification this being the case we can without difficulty conceive the possibility of so arranging a piece of mechanism that upon a starting 
in accordance with the data of the question to be solved it should continue its movements regularly progressively and undeviatingly towards the required solution since these movements however complex are never imagined to be otherwise than finite and determinate but the case is widely different with the chess player with him there is no determinate progression no one move in chess necessarily follows upon any one other from no particular disposition of the men at one period of a game can we predicate their disposition at a different period let us place the first move in a game of chess in juxtaposition with the data of an algebraical question and their great difference will be immediately perceived from the latter from the data the second step of the question dependent thereupon inevitably follows it is modelled by the data it must be thus and not otherwise but from the first move in the game of chess no especial second move follows of necessity in the algebraical question as it proceeds towards solution the certainty of its operations remains altogether unimpaired the second step having been a consequence of the data the third step is equally a consequence of the second the fourth of the third the fifth of the fourth and so on and not possibly otherwise to the end but in proportion to the progress made in a game of chess is the uncertainty of each ensuing move a few moves having been made no step is certain different spectators of the game would advise different moves all is then dependent upon the variable judgment of the players now even granting what should not be granted that the movements of the automaton chess player were in themselves determinate they would be necessarily interrupted and disarranged by the indeterminate will of his antagonist there is then no analogy whatever between the operations of the chess player and those of the calculating machine of mr babbage and if we choose to call the former a pure machine we must be prepared to admit that it is beyond all comparison the most wonderful of the inventions of mankind its original projector however baron keplin had no scruple in declaring it to be a very ordinary piece of mechanism a bagatelle whose effects appeared so marvellous only from the boldness of the conception and the fortunate choice of the methods adopted for promoting the illusion but it is needless to dwell upon this point it is quite certain that the operations of the automaton are regulated by mind and by nothing else indeed this matter is susceptible of a mathematical demonstration a priori the only question then is of the manner in which human agency is brought to bear before entering upon this subject it would be as well to give a brief history and description of the chess player for the benefit of such of our readers as may never have had an opportunity of witnessing mr malzell's exhibition the automaton chess player was invented in seventeen sixty nine by baron keplin a nobleman of pressburg in hungary who afterwards disposed of it together with the secret of its operations to its present possessor soon after its completion it was exhibited in Pressburg, Paris, Vienna, and other continental cities. In 1783 and 1784, it was taken to London by Mr. Malzell. Of late years, it has visited the principal towns in the United States. Wherever seen, the most intense curiosity was excited by its appearance, and numerous have been the attempts by men of all classes to fathom the mystery of its evolutions. The cut on this page gives a tolerable representation of the figure as seen by the citizens of Richmond a few weeks ago. 
the right arm however should lie more at length upon the box a chessboard should appear upon it and the cushion should not be seen while the pipe is held some immaterial alterations have been made in the costume of the player since it came into the position of mousel the plume for example was not originally worn at the hour appointed for exhibition a curtain is withdrawn or folding doors are thrown open and the machine rolled to within about twelve feet of the nearest of the spectators between whom and it the machine a rope is stretched a figure is seen habited as a turk and seated with its legs crossed at a large box apparently of maple wood which serves it as a table the exhibitor will if requested roll the machine to any portion of the room suffer it to remain altogether on any designated spot or even shift its location repeatedly during the progress of a game the bottom of the box is elevated considerably above the floor by means of the casters or brazen rollers on which it moves a clear view of the surface immediately beneath the automaton being thus afforded to the spectators the chair on which the figure sits is affixed permanently to the box on top of this latter is a chessboard also permanently affixed the right arm of the chess player is extended at full length before him at right angles with his body and lying in an apparently careless position by the side of the board the back of the hand is upwards the board itself is eighteen inches square the left arm of the figure is bent at the elbow and in the left hand is a pipe a green drapery conceals the back of the turk and falls partially over the front of both shoulders to judge from the external appearance of the box it is divided into five compartments three cupboards of equal dimensions and two drawers occupying that portion of the chest lying beneath the cupboards the foregoing observations apply to the appearance of the automaton upon its first introduction into the presence of the spectators mousel now informs the company that he will disclose to their view the mechanism of the machine taking from his pocket a bunch of keys he unlocks with them door marked one in the cut above and throws the cupboard fully open to the inspection of all present its whole interior is apparently filled with wheels pinions levers and other machinery crowded very closely together so that the eye can penetrate but a little distance into the mass leaving this door open to its full extent he goes now round to the back of the box and raising the drapery of the figure opens another door situated precisely in the rear of the one first opened holding a lighted candle at this door and shifting the position of the whole machine repeatedly at the same time a bright light is thrown entirely through the cupboard which is now clearly seen to be fully completely full of machinery the spectators being satisfied of this fact mousel closes the back door locks it takes the key from the lock lets fall the drapery of the figure and comes round to the front the door mark one it will be remembered is still open the exhibitor now proceeds to open the drawer which lies beneath the cupboards at the bottom of the box for although there are apparently two drawers there is really only one the two handles and two keyholes being intended merely for ornament having opened this drawer to its full extent a small cushion and a set of chessmen fixed in a framework made to support them perpendicularly are discovered leaving this drawer as well as cupboard number one open mousel now unlocks door number two and door number three which are discovered to be folding doors opening into one and the same compartment to the right of this compartment however that is to say the spectator's right a small division six inches wide 
and filled with machinery is partitioned off the main compartment itself in speaking of that portion of the box visible upon opening doors two and three we shall always call it the main compartment is lined with dark cloth and contains no machinery whatever beyond two pieces of steel quadrant shaped and situated one in each of the rear top corners of the compartment a small protuberance about eight inches square and also covered with dark cloth lies on the floor of the compartment near the rear corner on the spectator's left hand leaving doors number two and number three open as well as the drawer and door number one the exhibitor now goes round to the back of the main compartment and unlocking another door there displays clearly all the interior of the main compartment by introducing a candle behind it and within it the whole box being thus apparently disclosed to the scrutiny of the company mousel still leaving the doors and drawers open rolls the automaton entirely round and exposes the back of the turk by lifting up the drapery a door about ten inches square is thrown open in the loins of the figure and a smaller one also in the left thigh the interior of the figure as seen through these apertures appears to be crowded with machinery in general every spectator is now thoroughly satisfied of having beheld and completely scrutinized at one and the same time every individual portion of the automaton and the idea of any person being concealed in the interior during so complete an exhibition of that interior if ever entertained is immediately dismissed as preposterous in the extreme m mousel having rolled the machine back into its original position now informs the company that the automaton will play a game of chess with any one disposed to encounter him this challenge being accepted a small table is prepared for the antagonist and placed close by the rope but on the spectator's side of it and so situated as not to prevent the company from obtaining a full view of the automaton from a drawer in this table is taken a set of chessmen and mousel arranges them generally but not always with his own hands on the chessboard which consists merely of the usual number of squares painted upon the table the antagonist having taken his seat the exhibitor approaches the drawer of the box and takes therefrom the cushion which after removing the pipe from the hand of the automaton he places under its left arm as a support then taking also from the drawer the automaton set of chessmen he arranges them upon the chessboard before the figure he now proceeds to close the doors and to lock them leaving the bunch of keys in door number one he also closes the drawer and finally winds up the machine by applying a key to an aperture in the left end the spectator's left of the box the game now commences the automaton taking the first move the duration of the contest is usually limited to half an hour but if it be not finished at the expiration of this period and the antagonist still contend that he can beat the automaton m mousel has seldom any objection to continue it not to weary the company is the ostensible and no doubt the real object of the limitation it would of course be understood that when a move is made at his own table by the antagonist the corresponding move is made at the box of the automaton by mousel himself who then acts as the representative of the antagonist on the other hand when the turk moves the corresponding move is made at the table of the antagonist also by m mousel who then acts as the representative of the automaton in this manner it is necessary that the exhibitor should often pass from one table to the other he also frequently goes in rear of the figure to remove the chest men which it has taken and which it deposits when taken on the box to the left to its own left of the board 
when the automaton hesitates in relation to its move the exhibitor is occasionally seen to place himself very near its right side and to lay his hand now and then in a careless manner upon the box he has also a peculiar shuffle with his feet calculated to induce suspicion of collusion with the machine in minds which are more cunning than sagacious these peculiarities are no doubt mere mannerisms of m mazel or if he is aware of them at all he puts them in practice with a view of exciting in the spectators a false idea of the pure mechanism in the automaton the turk plays with his left hand and all movements of the arm are at right angles in this manner the hand which is gloved and bent in a natural way being brought directly above the piece to be moved descends finally upon it the fingers receiving it in most cases without difficulty occasionally however when the piece is not precisely in its proper situation the ottoman fails in his attempt at seizing it when this occurs no second effort is made but the arm continues its movement in the direction originally intended precisely as if the piece were in the fingers having thus designated the spot whither the move should have been made the arm returns to its cushion and mazel performs the evolution which the automaton pointed out at every movement of the figure machinery is heard in motion during the progress of the game the figure now and then rolls its eyes as if surveying the board moves its head and pronounces the word check when necessary if a false move be made by his antagonist he raps briskly on the box with the fingers of his right hand shakes his head roughly and replacing the piece falsely moved in his former situation assumes the next move himself upon beating the game he waves his head with an air of triumph looks round complacently upon the spectators and drawing his left arm farther back than usual suffers his fingers alone to rest upon the cushion in general the turk is victorious once or twice he has been beaten the game being ended mauser will again if desired exhibit the mechanism of the box in the same manner as before the machine is then rolled back and a curtain hides it from the view of the company there have been many attempts at solving the mystery of the automaton the most general opinion in relation to it an opinion too not unfrequently adopted by men who should have known better was as we have before said that no immediate human agency was employed in other words that the machine was purely a machine and nothing else many however have maintained that the exhibitor himself regulated the movements of the figure by mechanical means operating through the feet of the box Others, again, spoke confidently of a magnet. Of the first of these opinions, we shall say nothing at present more than we have already said. In relation to the second, it is only necessary to repeat what we have before stated, that the machine is rolled about on casters and will, at the request of a spectator, be moved to and fro to any portion of the room, even during the progress of a game the supposition of the magnet is also untenable for if a magnet were the agent any other magnet in the pocket of a spectator would disarrange the entire mechanism the exhibitor however will suffer the most powerful lodestone to remain even upon the box during the whole of the exhibition the first attempt at a written explanation of the secret at least the first attempt of which we ourselves have any knowledge was made in a large pamphlet printed at paris in seventeen eighty five the author's hypothesis amounted to this that a dwarf actuated the machine this dwarf he supposed to conceal himself during the opening of the box by thrusting his legs into two hollow cylinders 
which were represented to be but which are not among the machinery in the cupboard number one while his body was out of the box entirely and covered by the drapery of the turk when the doors were shut the dwarf was enabled to bring his body within the box the noise produced by some portion of the machinery allowing him to do so unheard and also to close the door by which he entered the interior of the automaton being then exhibited and, and no person discovered the spectators says the author of this pamphlet are satisfied that no one is within any portion of the machine this whole hypothesis was too obviously absurd to require comment or refutation and accordingly we find that it attracted very little attention in seventeen eighty nine a book was published at dresden by m i f freyhere in which another endeavor was made to unravel the mystery mr freyhere's book was a pretty large one and copiously illustrated by colored engravings his supposition was that a well-taught boy very thin and tall of his age sufficiently so that he could be concealed in a drawer almost immediately under the chessboard played the game of chess and effected all the evolutions of the automaton this idea although even more silly than that of the parisian author met with a better reception and was in some measure believed to be the true solution of the wonder until the inventor put an end to the discussion by suffering a close examination of the top of the box these bizarre attempts at explanation were followed by others equally bizarre of late years however an anonymous writer by a course of reasoning exceedingly unphilosophical has contrived to blunder upon a plausible solution although we cannot consider it altogether the true one his essay was first published in a baltimore weekly paper was illustrated by cuts and was entitled an attempt to analyze the automaton chess-player of m Malzel. This essay we suppose to have been the original of the pamphlet to which Sir David Brewster alludes in his letters on natural magic, and which he has no hesitation in declaring a thorough and satisfactory explanation. The result of the analysis are undoubtedly in the main just, but we can only account for Brewster's pronouncing the essay a thorough and satisfactory explanation by supposing him to have bestowed upon it a very cursory and inattentive perusal in the compendium of the essay made use of in the letters on natural magic it is quite impossible to arrive at any distinct conclusion in regard to the adequacy or inadequacy of the analysis on account of the gross misarrangement and deficiency of the letters of reference employed the same fault is to be found in the attempt etc as we originally saw it the solution consists in a series of minute explanations accompanied by woodcuts the whole occupying many pages in which the object is to show the possibility of so shifting the partitions of the box as to allow a human being concealed in the interior to move portions of his body from one part of the box to another during the exhibition of the mechanism thus eluding the scrutiny of the spectators there can be no doubt as we have before observed and as we will presently endeavour to show that the principle or rather the result of the solution is the true one some person is concealed in the box during the whole time of exhibiting the interior we object however to the whole verbose description of the manner in which the partitions are shifted to accommodate the movements of the person concealed we object to it as a mere theory assumed in the first place and to which circumstances are afterwards made to adapt themselves it was not and could not have been arrived at by any inductive reasoning in whatever way the shifting is managed it is of course concealed at every step from observation 
to show that certain movements might possibly be affected in a certain way is very far from showing that they are actually so effected there may be an infinity of other methods by which the same results may be obtained the probability of the one assumed proving the correct one is then as unity to infinity but in reality this particular point the shifting of the partitions is of no consequence whatever it was altogether unnecessary to devote seven or eight pages for the purpose of proving what no one in his senses would deny viz that the wonderful mechanical genius of baron keplin could invent the necessary means for shutting a door or slipping aside a panel with a human agent too at his service in actual contact with the panel or the door with the whole operations carried on as the author of the essay himself shows and as we shall attempt to show more fully hereafter entirely out of reach of the observation of the spectators in attempting ourselves an explanation of the automaton we will in the first place endeavor to show how its operations are affected and afterwards describe as briefly as possible the nature of the observations from which we have deduced our results End of section 18. Recording by Susan Morin, Portland, Maine. Section 19 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Malzell's Chess Player, Part 2, by Edgar Allan Poe. It will be necessary for a proper understanding of the subject that we repeat here, in a few words, the routine adopted by the exhibitor in disclosing the interior of the box a routine from which he never deviates in any material particular in the first place he opens the door number one leaving this open he goes round to the rear of the box and opens a door precisely at the back of door number one to this back door he holds a lighted candle he then closes the back door locks it and coming round to the front opens the drawer to its full extent this done he opens the doors number two and number three the folding doors and displays the interior of the main compartment leaving open the main compartment the drawer and the front door of cupboard number one he now goes to the rear again and throws open the back door of the main compartment. In shutting up the box, no particular order is observed, except that the folding doors are always closed before the drawer. Now, let us suppose that when the machine is first rolled in the presence of the spectators, a man is already within it his body is situated behind the dense machinery in cupboard number one the rear portion of the machinery is so contrived as to slip en masse from the main compartment to cupboard number one as occasion may require and his legs lie at full length in the main compartment when Malzell opens the door number one the man within is not in any danger of discovery for the keenest eyes cannot penetrate more than about two inches into the darkness within but the case is otherwise when the back door of the cupboard number one is open a bright light then pervades the cupboard and the body of the man would be discovered if it were there but it is not the putting the key in the lock of the back door 
was a signal on hearing which the person concealed wrought his body forward to an angle as acute as possible throwing it altogether or nearly so into the main compartment this however is a painful position and cannot be long maintained accordingly we find that malzel closes the back door this being done there is no reason why the body of the man may not resume its former situation for the cupboard is again so dark as to defy scrutiny the drawer is now open and the legs of the person within drop down behind it in the space it formerly occupied there is consequently now no longer any part of the man in the main compartment his body being behind the machinery in cupboard number one and his legs in the space occupied by the drawer the exhibitor therefore finds himself at liberty to display the main compartment this he does opening both its back and front doors and no person is discovered the spectators are now satisfied that the whole of the box is exposed to view and exposed to all portions of it at one and the same time but of course this is not the case they neither see the space behind the drawer nor the interior of cupboard number one the front door of which latter the exhibitor virtually shuts in shutting its back door Malzil, having now rolled the machine around, lifted up the drapery of the Turk, opened the doors in his back and thigh, and shown his trunk to be full of machinery, brings the whole back into its original position and closes the door. The man within is now at liberty to move about. He gets up into the body of the Turk, just so high as to bring his eyes above the level of the chessboard. It is very probable that he sits himself upon the little square block or protuberance which is seen in a corner of the main compartment when the doors are open. In this position he sees the chessboard through the bosom of the Turk, which is of gauze, bringing his right arm across his breast he actuates the little machinery necessary to guide the left arm and the fingers of the figure. This machinery is situated just beneath the left shoulder of the Turk, and is consequently easily reached by the right hand of the man concealed if we suppose his right arm brought across the breast. The motions of the head and eyes and of the right arm of the figure as well as the sound check are produced by other mechanism in the interior and actuated at will by the man within the whole of this mechanism that is to say all the mechanism essential to the machine is most probably contained within the little cupboard of about six inches in breadth partitioned off at the right the spectator's right of the main compartment in this analysis of the operations of the automaton we have purposely avoided any allusion to the manner in which the partitions are shifted and it will now be readily comprehended that this point is a matter of no importance since by mechanisms within the ability of any common carpenter it might be effected in an infinity of different ways and since we have shown that however performed it is performed out of the view of the spectators our result is founded upon the following observations taken during frequent visits to the exhibition of malzel one the moves of the turk are not made at regular intervals of time but accommodate themselves to the moves of the antagonist although this point of regularity so important to all kinds of mechanical contrivance might have been readily brought about by limiting the time allowed for the moves of the antagonist 
For example, if this limit were three minutes, the moves of the automaton might be made at any given intervals longer than three minutes. The fact, then, of irregularity when regularity might have been so easily attained goes to prove that regularity is unimportant to the action of the automaton. In other words, that the automaton is not a pure machine. 2. When the automaton is about to move a piece, a distinct motion is observable just beneath the left shoulder and which motion agitates in a slight degree the drapery covering the front of the left shoulder. This motion invariably precedes by about two seconds the movement of the arm itself, and the arm never in any instance moves without this preparatory motion in the shoulder. Now let the antagonist move a piece, and let the corresponding move be made by Mausel as usual upon the board of the automaton then let the antagonist narrowly watch the automaton until he detect the preparatory motion in the shoulder immediately upon detecting this motion and before the arm itself begins to move let him withdraw his piece as if perceiving an error in his maneuver it will then be seen that the movement of the arm which in all other cases immediately succeeds the motion in the shoulder is withheld is not made although mausel has not yet performed on the board of the automaton any move corresponding to the withdrawal of the antagonist in this case that the automaton was about to move is evident and that he did not move was an effect plainly produced by the withdrawal of the antagonist and without any intervention of mausel this fact fully proves one that the intervention of mausel in performing the moves of the antagonist on the board of the automaton is not essential to the movements of the automaton two that its movements are regulated by mind, by some person who sees the board of the antagonist. 3. That its movements are not regulated by the mind of Mausel, whose back was turned towards the antagonist at the withdrawal of his move. 3. The automaton does not invariably win the game. Were the machine a pure machine, this would not be the case. It would always win the principle being discovered by which a machine can be made to play a game of chess an extension of the same principle would enable it to win a game a farther extension would enable it to win all games that is to beat any possible game of an antagonist a little consideration will convince any one that the difficulty of making a machine beat all games is not in the least degree greater as regards the principle of the operations necessary than of making it beat a single game if then we regard the chess player as a machine we must suppose what is highly improbable that its inventor preferred leaving it incomplete to perfecting it a supposition rendered still more absurd when we reflect that the leaving it incomplete would afford an argument against the possibility of its being a pure machine the very argument we now adduce for when the situation of the game is difficult or complex we never perceive the turk either shake his head or roll his eyes it is only when his next move is obvious or when the game is so circumstanced that to a man in the automaton's place there would be no necessity for reflection now these peculiar movements of the head and eyes are movements customary with persons engaged in meditation and the ingenious baron keplin would have adapted these movements with a machine a pure machine to occasions proper for their display that is to occasions of complexity but the reverse is seen to be the case and this reverse applies precisely to our supposition of a man in the interior when engaged in meditation about the game he has no time to think of setting in motion the mechanism of the automaton by which are moved the head and the eyes 
when the game however is obvious he has time to look about him and accordingly we see the head shake and the eyes roll five when the machine is rolled round to allow the spectators an examination of the back of the turk and when his drapery is lifted up and the doors in the trunk and thigh thrown open the interior of the trunk is seen to be crowded with machinery in scrutinizing this machinery while the automaton was in motion that is to say while the whole machine was moving on the casters it appeared to us that certain portions of the mechanism changed their shape and position in a degree too great to be accounted for by the simple laws of perspective and subsequent examinations convince us that these undue alterations were attributable to mirrors in the interior of the trunk the introduction of mirrors among the machinery could not have been intended to influence in any degree the machinery itself their operation whatever the operation should prove to be must necessarily have reference to the eye of the spectator we at once conclude that these mirrors were so placed to multiply to the vision some few pieces of machinery within the trunk so as to give it the appearance of being crowded with mechanism now the direct inference from this is that the machine is not a pure machine for if it were the inventor so far from wishing its mechanism to appear complex and using deception for the purpose of giving it this appearance would have been especially desirous of convincing those who witnessed his exhibition of the simplicity of the means by which results so wonderful were brought about six the external appearance especially the deportment of the turk are when we consider them as imitations of life but very indifferent imitations the countenance evinces no ingenuity and is surpassed in its resemblance to the human face by the very commonest of waxworks the eyes roll unnaturally in the head without any corresponding motions of the lids or brows the arm particularly performs its operations in an exceedingly stiff awkward jerking and rectangular manner now all this is the result either of inability in mazel to do better or of intentional neglect accidental neglect being out of the question when we consider that the whole time of the ingenious proprietor is occupied in the improvement of his machines most assuredly we must not refer the unlife-like appearance to inability for all the rest of Malzell's automata are evidence of his full ability to copy the motions and peculiarities of life with the most wonderful exactitude the rope dancers for example are inimitable when the clown laughs his lips his eyes his eyebrows and eyelids indeed all the features of his countenance are imbued with their appropriate expressions in both him and his companion every gesture is so entirely easy and free from the semblance of artificiality that were it not for the diminutiveness of their size and the fact of their being passed from one spectator to another previous to their exhibition on the rope it would be difficult to convince any assemblage of persons that these wooden automata were not living creatures we cannot therefore doubt mr malzell's ability and we must necessarily suppose that he intentionally suffered his chess player to remain the same artificial and unnatural figure which baron kepler no doubt also through design originally made it what this design was it is not difficult to conceive were the automaton lifelike in its motions the spectator would be more apt to attribute its operations to their true cause that is to human agency within then he is now when the awkward and rectangular maneuvers convey the idea of pure and unaided mechanism seven when a short time previous to the commencement of the game the automaton is wound up by the exhibitor as usual 
an ear in any degree accustomed to the sounds produced in winding up a system of machinery will not fail to discover instantaneously that the axis turned by the key in the box of the chess player cannot possibly be connected with either a weight a spring or any system of machinery whatever the inference here is the same as in our last observation the winding up is inessential to the operations of the automaton and is performed with the design of exciting in the spectators the false idea of mechanism eight when the question is demanded explicitly of mazel is the automaton a pure machine or not his reply is invariably the same I will say nothing about it. Now the notoriety of the automaton and the great curiosity it has everywhere excited are owing more especially to the prevalent opinion that it is a pure machine than to any other circumstance. Of course, then, it is the interest of the proprietor to represent it as a pure machine and what more obvious and more effectual method could there be of impressing the spectators with this desired idea than a positive and explicit declaration to that effect on the other hand what more obvious and effectual method could there be of exciting a disbelief in the automaton's being a pure machine than by withholding such explicit declaration for people will naturally reason thus it is mausel's interest to represent this thing a pure machine he refuses to do so directly in words although he does not scruple and is evidently anxious to do so indirectly by actions were it actually what he wishes to represent it by actions he would gladly avail himself of the more direct testimony of words the inference is that a consciousness of its not being a pure machine is the reason of his silence his actions cannot implicate him in a falsehood his words may nine when in exhibiting the interior of the box mazel has thrown open the door number one and also the door immediately behind it he holds a lighted candle at the back door as mentioned above and moves the entire machine to and fro with a view of convincing the company that cupboard number one is entirely filled with machinery when the machine is thus moved about it will be apparent to any careful observer that whereas that portion of the machinery near the front door number one is perfectly steady and unwavering the portion farther within fluctuates in a very slight degree with the movements of the machine this circumstance first aroused in us the suspicion that the more remote portion of the machinery was so arranged as to be easily slipped en masse from its position when occasion should require it this occasion we have already stated to occur when the man concealed within brings his body into an erect position upon the closing of the back door Ten sir david brewster states the figure of the turk to be the size of life but in fact it is far above the ordinary size nothing is more easy than to err in our notions of magnitude the body of the automaton is generally insulated and having no means of immediately comparing it with any human form we suffer ourselves to consider it as of ordinary dimensions this mistake may however be corrected by observing the chess player when as is sometimes the case the exhibitor approaches it mr mazel to be sure is not very tall but upon drawing near the machine his head will be found at least eighteen inches below the head of the turk although the latter it will be remembered is in a sitting position eleven the box behind which the automaton is placed is precisely three feet six inches long two feet four inches deep and two feet six inches high these dimensions are sufficient for the accommodation of a man very much above the common size 
and the main compartment alone is capable of holding any ordinary man in the position we have mentioned and assumed by the person concealed as these are facts which any one who doubts them may prove by actual calculation we deem it unnecessary to dwell upon them we will only suggest that although the top of the box is apparently a board of about three inches in thickness the spectator may satisfy himself by stooping and looking up at it when the main compartment is open that it is in reality very thin the height of the drawer also will be misconceived by those who examine it in a cursory manner there is a space of about three inches between the top of the drawer as seen from the exterior and the bottom of the cupboard a space which must be included in the height of the drawer these contrivances to make the room within the box appear less than it actually is are referable to a design on the part of the inventor to impress the company again with a false idea viz that no human being can be accommodated within the box twelve the interior of the main compartment is lined throughout with cloth this cloth we suppose to have a twofold object a portion of it may form when tightly stretched the only partitions which there is any necessity for removing during the changes of the man's position viz the partition between the rear of the main compartment and the rear of the cupboard number one and the partition between the main compartment and the space behind the drawer when open if we imagine this to be the case the difficulty of shifting the partitions vanishes at once if indeed any such difficulty could be supposed under any circumstances to exist the second object of the cloth is to deaden and render indistinct all sounds occasioned by the movements of the person within thirteen the antagonist as we have observed is not suffered to play at the board of the automaton but is seated at some distance from the machine the reason which most probably would be assigned for this circumstance if the question were demanded is that were the antagonist otherwise situated his person would intervene between the machine and the spectators and preclude the latter from a distinct view but this difficulty might be easily obviated either by elevating the seats of the company or by turning the end of the box towards them during the game the true cause of the restriction is perhaps very different were the antagonist seated in contact with the box the secret would be liable to discovery by his detecting with the aid of a quick ear the breathing of the man concealed fourteen although m mausel in disclosing the interior of the machine sometimes slightly deviates from the routine which we have pointed out yet really in any instance does he so deviate from it as to interfere with our solution for example he has been known to open first of all the drawer but he never opens the main compartment without first closing the back door of cupboard number one he never opens the main compartment without first pulling out the drawer he never shuts the drawer without first shutting the main compartment he never opens the back door of cupboard number one while the main compartment is open and the game of chess is never commenced until the whole machine is closed and if it were observed that never in any single instance did m malzel differ from the routine we have pointed out as necessary to our solution it would be one of the strongest possible arguments in corroboration of it but the argument becomes infinitely strengthened if we duly consider the circumstance that he does occasionally deviate from the routine but never does so deviate as to falsify the solution fifteen there are six candles on the board of the automaton during exhibition the question naturally arises why are so many employed 
when a single candle or at farthest two would have been amply sufficient to afford the spectators a clear view of the board in a room otherwise so well lit up as the exhibition room always is when moreover if we suppose the machine a pure machine there can be no necessity for so much light or indeed any light at all to enable it to perform its operations and when especially only a single candle is placed upon the table of the antagonist the first and most obvious inference is that so strong a light is requisite to enable the man within to see through the transparent material probably fine gauze of which the breast of the turk is composed but when we consider the arrangement of the candles another reason immediately presents itself there are six lights as we have said before in all three of these are on each side of the figure those most remote from the spectators are the longest those in the middle are about two inches shorter and those nearest the company about two inches shorter still and the candles on one side differ in height from the candles respectively opposite on the other by a ratio different from two inches that is to say the longest candle on one side is about three inches shorter than the longest candle on the other and so on thus it will be seen that no two of the candles are of the same height and thus also the difficulty of ascertaining the material of the breast of the figure against which the light is especially directed is greatly augmented by the dazzling effect of the complicated crossing of the rays crossings which are brought about by placing the centers of radiation all upon different levels sixteen while the chess player was in possession of baron keplin it was more than once observed first that an italian in the suite of the baron was never visible during the playing of a game at chess by the turk and secondly that the italian being taken seriously ill the exhibition was suspended until his recovery the italian professed a total ignorance of the game of chess although all others of the suite played well similar observations have been made since the automaton has been purchased by Mazel there is a man schlumberger who attends him wherever he goes but who has no ostensible occupation other than that of assisting in the packing and unpacking of the automata this man is about the medium size and has a remarkable stoop in the shoulders whether he professes to play chess or not we are not informed it is quite certain however that he is never to be seen during the exhibition of the chess player although frequently visible just before and just after the exhibition moreover some years ago Mauzo visited richmond with his automata and exhibited them we believe in the house now occupied by monsieur beauxieux as a dancing academy schlumberger was suddenly taken ill and during his illness there was no exhibition of the chess player these facts are well known to many of our citizens the reason assigned for the suspicion of the chess player's performance was not the illness of schlumberger the inferences from all this we leave without farther comment to the reader seventeen the turk plays with his left arm a circumstance so remarkable cannot be accidental brewster takes no notice of it whatever beyond a mere statement we believe that such is the fact the early writers of trustees on the automaton seem not to have observed the matter at all and have no reference to it the author of the pamphlet alluded to by brewster mentions it but acknowledges his inability to account for it yet it is obviously from such prominent discrepancies or incongruities 
as this the deductions are to be made if made at all which shall lead us to the truth the circumstance of the automaton's playing with his left hand cannot have connection with the operations of the machine considered merely as such any mechanical arrangement would cause the figure to move in any given manner the left arm could if reversed cause it to move in the same manner the right but these principles cannot be extended to the human organization wherein there is a marked and radical difference in the construction and at all events in the powers of the right and left arms reflecting upon this latter fact we naturally refer to the incongruity noticeable in the chess player to this peculiarity in the human organization if so we must imagine some reversion for the chess player plays precisely as a man would not these ideas once entertained are sufficient of themselves to suggest the notion of a man in the interior a few more perceptible steps lead us finally to the result the automaton plays with his left arm because under no other circumstances could the man within play with his right a desideratum of course let us for example imagine the automaton to play with his right arm to reach the machinery which moves the arm which we have before explained to lie just beneath the shoulder it would be necessary for the man within either to use his right arm in an exceedingly painful and awkward position viz brought up close to his body and tightly compressed between his body and the side of the automaton or else to use his left arm brought across his breast in neither case could he act with the requisite ease or precision on the contrary the automaton playing as it actually does with the left arm all difficulties vanish the right arm of the man within is brought across his breast and his right fingers act without any constraint upon the machinery in the shoulder of the figure we do not believe that any reasonable objection can be urged against this solution of the automaton chess player end of section nineteen recording by susan moore in portland maine Section 20 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Power of Words by Edgar Allan Poe. Pardon, Agathos, the weakness of a spirit new fledged with immortality. You have spoken nothing, my Oinos, for which pardon is to be demanded. Not even here is knowledge thing of intuition. For wisdom, ask of the angels freely that it may be given. But in this existence, I dreamed that I should be at once cognizant of all things, and thus at once be happy in being cognizant of all. Ah, but not in knowledge is happiness, but in the acquisition of knowledge. In forever knowing, we are forever blessed, but to know all were the curse of a fiend. But does not the Most High know all? That, since he is the most happy, must be still the one thing unknown even to him. But since we grow hourly in knowledge, must not at last all things be known? Look down into the abysmal distances. Attempt to force the gaze down the multitudinous vistas of the stars, as we sweep slowly through them thus, and thus, and thus. Even the spiritual vision, is it not at all points arrested by the continuous golden walls of the universe? the walls of the myriads of the shining bodies that mere number has appeared to blend into unity i clearly perceive that the infinity of matter is no dream there are no dreams in aden but it is here whispered that of this infinity of matter the sole purpose is to afford infinite springs at which the soul may allay the thirst to know which is forever unquenchable within it since to quench it would be to extinguish the soul's self Question me then, my Oinos, freely and without fear. Come, we will leave to the left of the loud harmony of the Pleiades, and swoop outward from the throne into the starry meadows beyond Orion, 
where for pansies and violets and heart's ease are the beds of the triplicate and triple tinted suns. And now, Agathos, as we proceed, instruct me. Speak to me in the earth's familiar tones. I understand not what you hinted to me, just now of the modes or of the methods, of what during mortality we are accustomed to call creation. Do you mean to say that the Creator is not God? I mean to say that the Deity does not create. Explain. In the beginning only he created. The seeming creatures which now, throughout the universe, so perpetually springing into being, can only be considered as the mediate or indirect, not as the direct or immediate results of the divine creative power. Among men, my Agathos, this idea would be considered heretical in the extreme. Among angels, my Onos, it is seen to be simply true. I can comprehend you thus far, that certain operations of what we term nature, or the natural laws, will, under certain conditions, give rise to that which has all the appearance of creation. Shortly before the final overthrow of the earth, there were, I well remember, many very successful experiments in what some philosophers were weak enough to denominate the creation of animalculae. The cases of which you speak were, in fact, instances of the secondary creation, and of the only species of creation which has ever been, since the first word spoke into existence, the first law. Are not the starry worlds that, from the abyss of nonentity, burst hourly forth into the heavens? Are not these stars, Agathos, the immediate handiwork of the king? Let me endeavour, my owners, to lead you step by step to the conception I intend. You are well aware that, as no thought can perish, so no act is without infinite result. We moved our hands, for example, when we were dwellers on the earth, and, in so doing, gave vibration to the atmosphere which engirdled it. This vibration was indefinitely extended, till it gave impulse to every particle of the earth's air, which, thenceforward and forever, was actuated by the one movement of the hand. This fact the mathematicians of our globe well knew. They made the special effects, indeed, wrought in the fluid by special impulses, the subject of exact calculation, so that it became easy to determine in what precise period an impulse of given extent would engirdle the orb, and impress, forever, every atom of the atmosphere circumambient. Retrograding, they found no difficulty, from a given effect, under given conditions, in determining the value of the original impulse. Now, the mathematicians who saw that the results of any given impulse were absolutely endless, and who saw that a portion of these results were accurately traceable through the agency of algebraic analysis, who saw too the facility of the retrogradation, these men saw, at the same time, that this species of analysis itself had within itself a capacity for indefinite progress, that there were no bounds conceivable to its advancement and applicability, except within the intellect of him who advanced or applied it. But at this point our mathematicians paused. And why, Agathos, should they have proceeded? because there were some considerations of deep interest beyond. It was deducible from what they knew, that to a being of infinite understanding, one to whom the perfection of the algebraic analysis lay unfolded, there could be no difficulty in tracing every impulse given the air, and the ether through the air, to the remotest consequences at any even infinitely remote epoch of time. It is indeed demonstrable that every such impulse given the air must, in the end, impress every individual thing that exists within the universe, and the being of infinite understanding, the being whom we have imagined, might trace the remote undulations of the impulse, trace them upward and onward in their influences upon all particles of a matter, upward and onward forever in their modifications of old forms, or, in other words, in their creation of new, until he found them reflected, unimpressive at last, back from the throne of the Godhead. And not only could such a thing do this, but at any epoch, should a given result be afforded him, should one of these numberless comets, for example, be presented to his inspection, he could have no difficulty in determining, by the analytic retrogradation, to what original impulse it was due. This power of retrogradation, in its absolute fullness and perfection, this facility of referring at all epochs, all effects to all causes, is of course the prerogative of the deity alone, but in every variety of degree, short of the absolute perfection, is the power itself exercised by the whole host of the angelic intelligences. But you speak merely of impulses upon the air. In speaking of the air, I referred only to the earth, but the general proposition has reference to impulses upon the ether, which, since it pervades and alone pervades all space, is thus the great medium of creation. Then all motion, 
of whatever nature creates? It must, but a true philosophy has long taught that the source of all motion is thought, and the source of all thought is... God. I have spoken to you, Oinos, as to a child of the fair earth which lately perished, of impulses upon the atmosphere of the earth. You did? And while I thus spoke, did there not cross your mind some thought of the physical power of words? Is not every word an impulse on the air? But why, Agathos, do you weep? And why, oh, why do your wings droop as we hover above this fair star, which is the greenest and yet most terrible of all we have encountered in our flight? Its brilliance flowers like a fairy dream, but its fierce volcanoes like the passions of a turbulent heart. They are, they are. This wild star, it is now three centuries since, with clasped hands and with streaming eyes, at the feet of my beloved, I spoke it, with a few passionate sentences, into birth. Its brilliant flowers are the dearest of all unfulfilled dreams, and its raging volcanoes are the passions of the most turbulent and unhallowed of hearts. End of section 20section 21 of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org monos recording by trisha g una recording by nikki kano the colloquy of monos and una by edgar allan poe these things are in the future. Sophocles, Antigone. Born again? Yes, fairest and most beloved Una, born again. These were the words upon whose mystical meaning I had so long pondered, rejecting the explanations of the priesthood, until death himself resolved for me the secret. Death? How strangely, sweet Una, you echo my words. I observe, too, a vacillation in your step, a joyous inquietude in your eyes. You are confused and oppressed by the majestic novelty of the life eternal. Yes, it was of death I spoke. And here how singularly sounds that word, which of old was wont to bring terror to all hearts, throwing a mildew upon all pleasures. Ah, death, the spectre which sate at all feasts! How often, Monos, did we lose ourselves in speculations upon its nature? How mysteriously did it act as a check to human bliss, saying unto it, Thus far, and no farther. That earnest mutual love, my own Monos, which burned within our bosoms, how vainly did we flatter ourselves, feeling happy in its first upspringing, that our happiness would strengthen with its strength. Alas, as it grew, so grew in our hearts the dread of that evil hour which was hurrying to separate us forever. Thus, in time, it became painful to love. Hate would have been mercy then. Speak not here of these griefs, dear Una. Mine, mine for ever now. But the memory of past sorrow, is it not present joy? I have much to say yet of the things which have been. Above all, I burn to know the incidents of your own passage through the dark valley and shadow. And when did the radiant Una ask anything of her monos in vain? I will be minute in relating all. But at what point shall the weird narrative begin? At what point? You have said. Monos, I comprehend you. In death we have both learned the propensity of man to define the indefinable. I will not say, then, commence with the moment of life's cessation, but commence with that sad, sad instant when, the fever having abandoned you, you sank into a breathless and motionless torpor, and I pressed down your pallid eyelids with the passionate fingers of love. One word first, my Una, in regard to man's general condition at this epoch. You will remember that one or two of the wise among our forefathers, wise in fact, although not in the world's esteem, had ventured to doubt the propriety of the term improvement as applied to the progress of our civilization. There were periods in each of the five or six centuries immediately preceding our dissolution when arose some vigorous intellect, boldly contending for those principles whose truth appears now to our disenfranchised reason, 
so utterly obvious, principles which should have taught our race to submit to the guidance of the natural laws, rather than attempt their control. At long intervals some masterminds appeared, looking upon each advance in practical science as a retrogradation in the true utility. Occasionally the poetic intellect, that intellect which we now feel to have been the most exalted of all, since those truths which to us were of the most enduring importance could only be reached by that analogy which speaks in proof tones to the imagination alone, and to the unaided reason bears no weight, occasionally did this poetic intellect proceed a step farther in the evolving of the vague idea of the philosophic, and find in the mystic parable that tells of the tree of knowledge, and of its forbidden fruit, death-producing, a distinct intimation that knowledge was not meet for man in the infant condition of his soul. And these men, the poets, living and perishing amid the scorn of the utilitarians, of rough pedants who abrogated to themselves a title which could have been properly applied only to the scorned, these men, the poets, pondered piningly, yet not unwisely, upon the ancient days when our wants were not more simple than our enjoyments were keen, days when mirth was a word unknown, so solemnly deep-toned was happiness, holy, august, and blissful days when blue rivers ran undammed, between hills unhewn, into far forest solitudes, primeval, odorous, and unexplored. Yet these noble exceptions from the general misrule served but to strengthen it by opposition. Alas, we had fallen upon the most evil of all our evil days. The great movement, that was the cant term, went on, a diseased commotion moral and physical. Art, the arts, arose supreme, and, once enthroned, cast chains upon the intellect which had elevated them to power. Man, because he could not but acknowledge the majesty of nature, fell into childish exultation at his acquired and still increasing dominion over her elements. Even while he stalked a god in his own fancy, an infantine imbecility came over him. As might be supposed from the origin of his disorder, he grew infected with system and with abstraction. He enwrapped himself in generalities. Among other odd ideas, that of universal equality gained ground, and in the face of analogy and of God, in despite of the loud warning voice of the laws of gradation so visibly pervading all things in earth and heaven, wild attempts at an omniprevalent democracy were made. Yet this evil sprang necessarily from the leading evil, knowledge. Man could not both know and succumb. Meantime huge smoking cities arose innumerable, Green leaves shrank before the hot breath of furnaces. The fair face of nature was deformed as with the ravages of some loathsome disease. And methinks, sweet Una, even our slumbering sense of the forced and of the far-fetched might have arrested us here. But now it appears that we had worked out our own destruction in the perversion of our taste, or rather in the blind neglect of its culture in the schools. For in truth, it was at this crisis that taste alone, that faculty which, holding a middle position between the pure intellect and the moral sense, could never safely have been disregarded, it was now that taste alone could have led us gently back to beauty, to nature, and to life. But alas for the pure contemplative spirit and majestic intuition of Plato! Alas, for the which he justly regarded as an all-sufficient education for the soul! Alas, for him and for it! Since both were most desperately needed, when both were most entirely forgotten or despised. Pascal, a philosopher whom we both love, has said, how truly, Que tu notre raisonnement se ruidit et se der au sentiment and it is not impossible that the sentiment of the natural, had time permitted it, would have gained its old ascendancy over the harsh mathematical reason of the schools. But this thing was not to be. Prematurely induced by intemperance of knowledge, the old age of the world drew on. This the mass of mankind saw not. 
or, living lustily although unhappily, affected not to see. But for myself, the earth's records had taught me to look for widest ruin as the price of highest civilization. I had imbibed a prescience of our fate from comparison of China, the simple and enduring, with Assyria the architect, with Egypt the astrologer, with Nubia, more crafty than either, the turbulent mother of all arts. In history of these regions I met with a ray from the future. The individual artificialities of the three latter were local diseases of the earth, and in their individual overthrows we had seen local remedies applied. But for the infected world at large I could anticipate no regeneration save in death. That man, as a race, should not become extinct, I saw that he must be born again. And now it was, fairest and dearest, that we wrapped our spirits daily in dreams. Now it was that, in twilight, we discoursed of the days to come, when the art-scarred surface of the earth, having undergone that purification which alone could efface its rectangular obscenities, should clothe itself anew in the verdure and the mountain slopes and the smiling waters of paradise, and be rendered at length a fit dwelling place for man, for man the death purged, for man to whose now exalted intellect there should be poison in knowledge no more, for the redeemed, regenerated, blissful, and now immortal, but still for the material man. Well do I remember these conversations, dear Monos. But the epoch of the fiery overthrow was not so near at hand as we believed, and as the corruption you indicated surely warrant us in believing. Men lived and died individually. You yourself sickened and passed into the grave, and thither your constant Una speedily followed you. And though the century which has since elapsed, and whose conclusion brings us thus together once more, tortured our slumbering senses with no impatience of duration, Yet, my monos, it was a century still. Say, rather, a point in the vague infinity. Unquestionably, it was in the earth's dotage that I died. Wearied at heart with anxieties which had their origin in the general turmoil and decay, I succumbed to the fierce fever. After some few days of pain, and many of dreamy delirium replete with ecstasy, the manifestations of which you mistook for pain, while I longed but was impotent to undeceive you, after some days there came upon me, as you have said, a breathless and motionless torpor, and this was termed death by those who stood around me. Words are vague things. My condition did not deprive me of sentience. It appeared to me not greatly dissimilar to the extreme quiescence of him who, having slumbered long and profoundly, lying motionless and fully prostrate in a midsummer noon, begins to steal slowly back into consciousness, through the mere sufficiency of his sleep, and without being awakened by external disturbances. I breathed no longer, the pulses were still, the heart had ceased to beat. Volition had not departed, but was powerless. The senses were unusually active, although eccentrically so, assuming often each other's functions at random. The taste and the smell were inextricably confounded, and became one sentiment, abnormal and intense. The rose-water with which your tenderness had moistened my lips to the last, affected me with sweet fancies of flowers, fantastic flowers, far more lovely than any of the old earth, but whose prototypes we have here blooming around us. The eyelids, transparent and bloodless, offered no complete impediment to vision. As volition was in abeyance, the balls could not roll in their sockets, but all objects within the range of the visual hemisphere were seen with more or less distinctness. The rays which fell upon the external retina, or into the corner of the eye, producing a more vivid effect than those which struck the front or interior surface. Yet, in the former instance, this effect was so far anomalous that I appreciated it only as sound, sound sweet or discordant as the matters presenting themselves at my side were light or dark in shade, curved or angular in outline. The hearing, at the same time, 
although excited in degree, was not irregular in action, estimating real sounds with an extravagance of precision, not less than of sensibility. Touch had undergone a modification more peculiar. Its impressions were tardily received, but pertinaciously retained, and resulted always in the highest physical pleasure. Thus the pressure of your sweet fingers upon my eyelids, at first only recognized through vision, at length, long after their removal, filled my whole being with a sensual delight immeasurable. I say with sensual delight, all my perceptions were purely sensual. The materials furnished the passive brain by the senses were not in the least degree wrought into shape by the deceased understanding of pain there was some little, of pleasure there was much, but of moral pain or pleasure none at all. Thus your wild sobs floated into my ear with all their mournful cadences, and were appreciated in their every variation of sad tone, but they were soft musical sounds and no more. They conveyed to the extinct reason no intimation of the sorrows which gave them birth, while the large and constant tears which fell upon my face, telling the bystanders of a heart which broke, thrilled every fibre of my frame with ecstasy alone. And this was in truth the death of which these bystanders spoke reverently, in low whispers, you, sweet Una, gaspingly, with loud cries. They attired me for the coffin, three or four dark figures which flitted busily to and fro, as these crossed the direct line of my vision, they affected me as forms, but upon passing to my side, their images impressed me with the idea of shrieks, groans, and other dismal expressions of terror, of horror, or of woe. You alone, habited in a white robe, passed in all directions musically about me. The day waned, and, as its light faded away, I became possessed by a vague uneasiness an anxiety such as the sleeper feels when sad real sounds fall continuously within his ear, low distant bell-tones, solemn, at long but equal intervals, and mingling with melancholy dreams. Night arrived, and with its shadows a heavy discomfort. It oppressed my limbs with the oppression of some dull weight, and was palpable. There was also a moaning sound, not unlike the distant reverberation of surf, but more continuous, which, beginning with the first twilight, had grown in strength with the darkness. Suddenly lights were brought into the room, and this reverberation became forthwith interrupted into frequent unequal bursts of the same sound, but less dreary and less distinct. The ponderous oppression was in a great measure relieved, and, issuing from the flame of each lamp, for there were many, there flowed unbrokenly into my ears a strain of melodious monotone. And when now, dear Una, approaching the bed upon which I lay outstretched, you sat gently by my side, breathing odour from your sweet lips, and pressing them upon my brow, there arose tremulously within my bosom, and mingling with the merely physical sensations which circumstances had called forth, a something akin to sentiment itself, a feeling that, half appreciating, half responded to your earnest love and sorrow. But this feeling took no root in the pulseless heart, and seemed indeed rather a shadow than a reality, and faded quickly away, first into extreme quiescence, and then into a purely sensual pleasure as before. And now, from the wreck and the chaos of the usual senses, there appeared to have arisen within me a sixth, all perfect. In its exercise I found a wild delight, yet a delight still physical, inasmuch as the understanding had in it no part. Motion in the animal frame had fully ceased. No muscle quivered, no nerve thrilled, no artery throbbed. But there seemed to have sprung up in the brain, that of which no words could convey to the merely human intelligence even an indistinct conception. Let me term it a mental pendulous pulsation. It was the moral embodiment of man's abstract idea of time. By the absolute equalization of this movement, or of such as this, 
had the cycles of the firmamental orbs themselves been adjusted. By its aid I measured the irregularities of the clock upon the mantel, and of the watches of the attendants. Their tickings came sonorously to my ears. The slightest deviations from the true proportion, and these deviations were omniprevalent, affected me just as violations of abstract truth were wont, on earth, to affect the moral sense. Although no two of the timepieces in the chamber struck the individual seconds accurately together, yet I had no difficulty in holding steadily in mind the tones and the respective momentary errors of each. And this, this keen, perfect, self-existing sentiment of duration, this sentiment existing, as man could not possibly have conceived it to exist, independently of any succession of events, this idea, this sixth sense, upspringing from the ashes of the rest, was the first obvious and certain step of the intemporal soul upon the threshold of the temporal eternity. It was midnight, and you still sat by my side. All others had departed from the chamber of death. They had deposited me in the coffin. The lamps burned flickeringly, for this I knew by the tremulousness of the monotonous strains but suddenly these strains diminished in distinctness and in volume. Finally they ceased. The perfume in my nostrils died away. Forms affected my vision no longer. The oppression of the darkness uplifted itself from my bosom. A dull shock, like that of electricity, pervaded my frame, and was followed by total loss of the idea of contact. All of what man has termed sense was merged in the sole consciousness of entity, and in the one abiding sentiment of duration. The mortal body had been at length stricken with the hand of the deadly decay. Yet had not all of sentience departed, for the consciousness and the sentiment remaining supplied some of its functions by a lethargic intuition. I appreciated the direful change now in operation upon the flesh, and, as the dreamer is sometimes aware of the bodily presence of one who leans over him, so, sweet Una, I still dully felt that you sat by my side. So, too, when the noon of the second day came, I was not unconscious of those movements which displaced you from my side, which confined me within the coffin, which deposited me within the hearse, which bore me to the grave, which lowered me within it, which heaped heavily the mould upon me, and which thus left me, in blackness and corruption, to my sad and solemn slumbers with the worm. And here, in the prison-house which has few secrets to disclose, there rolled away days and weeks and months, and the soul watched narrowly each second as it flew, and, without effort, took record of its flight, without effort and without object. A year passed, the consciousness of being had grown hourly more indistinct, and that of mere locality had, in great measure, usurped its position. The idea of entity was becoming merged in that of place. The narrow space immediately surrounding what had been the body was now growing to be the body itself. At length, as often happens to the sleeper, by sleep and its world alone is death imaged, at length, as sometimes happened on earth to the deep slumberer, when some flitting light half startled him into waking, yet left him half enveloped in dreams, so to me, in the strict embrace of the shadow, came that light which alone might have had power to startle, the light of enduring love. Men toiled at the grave in which I lay darkling. They upthrew the damp earth. Upon my mouldering bones there descended the coffin of Una and now again all was void. That nebulous light had been extinguished. That feeble thrill had vibrated itself into quiescence. Many lustra had supervened. Dust had returned to dust. The worm had food no more. The sense of being had at length utterly departed, and there reigned in its stead, instead of all things, dominant and perpetual, the autocrat's place and time for that which was not, for that which had no form, for that which had no thought, for that which had no sentience, 
for that which was soulless, yet of which matter formed no portion, for all this nothingness, yet for all this immortality, the grave was still a home, and the corrosive hours co-mates. End of section 21「Section 22 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conversation of Iros and Charmion by Edgar Allan Poe. Why do you call me Iros? So henceforth will you always be called. You must forget, too, my earthly name, and speak to me as Charmion. This is indeed no dream. Dreams are with us no more. But of these mysteries anon, I rejoice to see you looking life, like and rational. The film of the shadow has already passed from off your eyes. Be of heart and fear nothing. Your allotted days of stupor have expired, and to-morrow I will myself induct you into the full joys and wonders of your novel existence. True, I feel no stupor, none at all. The wild sickness and the terrible darkness have left me, and I hear no longer that mad, rushing, horrible sound, like the voice of many waters. Yet my senses are bewildered, Charmion, with the keenness of their perception of the new. A few days will remove all this, but I fully understand you, and feel for you. It is of now ten earthly years since I underwent what you undergo, yet the remembrance of it hangs by me still. You have now suffered all of pain, however, which you will now suffer in Aiden. In Aiden? In Aiden. Oh, God, pity me, Charmion, I am overburthened with the majesty of all things, of the unknown now known, of the speculative future merged in the august and certain present. Grapple not now with such thoughts. Tomorrow we will speak of this. Your mind wavers, and its agitation will find relief in the exercise of simple memories. Look not around, nor forward, but back. I am burning with anxiety to hear the details of that stupendous event which threw you among us. Tell me of it. Let us converse of familiar things in the old familiar language of the world which has so fearfully perished. Most fearfully, fearfully, this is indeed no dream. Dreams are no more. Was I much mourned, my Eros? Mourned, Charmion. Oh, deeply. To that last hour of all there hung a cloud of intense gloom and devout sorrow over your household. And that last hour, speak of it. Remember that, beyond the naked fact of the catastrophe itself, I know nothing. When coming out from among mankind, I passed into night through the grave. At that period, if I remember all right, the calamity which overwhelmed you was utterly unanticipated. But, indeed, I knew little of the speculative philosophy of the day. The individual calamity was, as you say, entirely unanticipated, but analogous misfortunes had been long a subject of discussion with astronomers. I need scarce tell you, my friend, that even when you left us, men had agreed to understand those passages in the most holy writings which speak of the final destruction of all things by fire, as having reference to the orb of the earth alone. But in regard to the immediate agency of the ruin, Speculation had been at fault from that epoch in astronomical knowledge, in which the comets were divested of the terrors of flame. The very moderate density of these bodies had been well established. They had been observed to pass among the satellites of Jupiter, without bringing about any sensible alteration, either in the masses or in the orbits, of these secondary planets. We had long regarded the wanderers as vapoury creations of inconceivable tenuity, and as altogether incapable of doing injury to our substantial globe, even in the event of contact. But contact was not in any degree dreaded, for the elements of all the comets were accurately known. That among them we should look for the agency of the threatened fiery destruction had been for many years considered an inadmissible idea. But wonders and wild fancies had been, of late days, strangely rife among mankind. And although it was only with a few of the ignorant that actual apprehension prevailed, upon the announcement by astronomers of a new comet, Yet this announcement was generally received with I know not what of agitation and mistrust. The elements of the strange orb were immediately calculated, and it was at once conceded by all observers that its path at perihelion would bring it into very close proximity with the earth. There were two or three astronomers of secondary note, 
who resolutely maintained that a comet was inevitable. I cannot very well express to you the very effect of this intelligence upon the people. For a few short days they would not believe an assertion which their intellect, so long employed among worldly considerations, could not in any manner grasp. But the truth of a vitally important fact soon makes its way into the understanding of even the most stolid. Finally, all men saw that astronomical knowledge lied not, and they awaited the comet. Its approach was not, at first, seemingly rapid, nor was its appearance of very unusual character. It was of a dull red, and had little perceptible train. For seven or eight days we saw no material increase in its apparent diameter, and but a partial alteration in its colour. Meantime the ordinary affairs of men were discarded and all interests absorbed in a growing discussion, instituted by the philosophic, in respect to the cometary nature. Even the grossly ignorant aroused their sluggish capacities to such considerations. The learned now gave their intellect, their soul, to no such points as the allaying of fear, or to the sustenance of loved theory. They sought, they panted for right views, they groaned for perfected knowledge. Truth arose in the purity of her strength and exceeding majesty, and the wise bowed down and adored. That material injury to our globe or to its inhabitants would result from the apprehended contact was an opinion which hourly lost ground among the wise, and the wise were now freely permitted to rule the reason and the fancy of the crowd. It was demonstrated that the density of the comet's nucleus was far less than that of our rarest gases, and the harmless passage of a similar visitor among the satellites of Jupiter was a point strongly insisted upon, and which served greatly to allay terror. Theologists, with an earnestness fearing kindled, dwelt upon the biblical prophecies, and expounded them to the people with a directness and simplicity of which no previous instance had been known. That the final destruction of the earth must be brought about by the agency of fire was urged with a spirit that enforced everywhere conviction, and that the comets were of no fiery nature, as all men now knew, was a truth which relieved all, in a great measure, from the apprehension of the great calamity foretold. It is noticeable that the popular prejudices and vulgar errors in regard to pestilences and wars, errors which were wont to prevail upon every appearance of a comet, were now altogether unknown, as if by some sudden convulsive exertion reason had at once hurled superstition from her throne. The feeblest intellect had derived vigour from an excessive interest. What minor evils might arise from the contact were points of elaborate question. The learned spoke of slight geological disturbances, of probable alterations in climate, and consequently in vegetation, of possible magnetic and electric influences. Many held that no visible or perceptible effect would in any manner be produced. While such discussions were going on, their subject gradually approached, growing larger in apparent diameter, and of a more brilliant lustre. Mankind grew paler as it came. All human operations were suspended. There was an epoch in the course of the general sentiment when the comet had attained, at length, a size surpassing that of any previously recorded visitation. The people now, dismissing any lingering hope that the astronomers were wrong, experienced all the certainty of evil. The chimerical aspect of their terror was gone. The hearts of the stoutest of our race beat violently within their bosoms. A very few days sufficed, however, to merge even such feelings and sentiments more unendurable. We could no longer apply to the strange orb any accustomed thoughts. Its historical attributes had disappeared. It oppressed us with a hideous novelty of emotion. We saw it not as an astronomical phenomenon in the heavens, but as an incubus upon our hearts and a shadow upon our brains. It had taken, with inconceivable rapidity, the character of a gigantic mantle of rare flame extending from horizon to horizon. Yet a day, and men breathed with greater freedom. It was clear that we were already within the influence of the comet, yet we lived. We even felt an unusual elasticity of frame and vivacity of mind. The exceeding tenuity of the object of our dread was apparent, for all heavenly objects were plainly visible through it. Meantime our vegetation had perceptibly altered, and we gained faith from this predicted circumstance in the foresight of the wise. A wild luxuriance of foliage, utterly unknown before, burst out upon every vegetable thing. Yet another day, and the evil was not altogether upon us. It was now evident that its nucleus would first reach us. A wild change had come over all men, and the first sense of pain was the wild signal for general lamentation and horror. 
The first sense of pain lay in a rigorous constriction of the breast and lungs, and an insufferable dryness of the skin. It could not be denied that our atmosphere was radically affected. The confirmation of this atmosphere and the possible modifications to which it might be subjected were now the topics of discussion. The result of investigation sent an electric thrill of the intensest terror through the universal heart of man. It had been long known that the air which encircled us was a compound of oxygen and nitrogen gases, in the proportion of twenty-one measures of oxygen and seventy-nine of nitrogen in every one hundred of the atmosphere. Oxygen, which was the principle of combustion, and the vehicle of heat, was absolutely necessary to the support of animal life, and was the most powerful and energetic agent in nature. Nitrogen, on the contrary, was incapable of supporting either animal life or flame. An unnatural excess of oxygen would result, it had been ascertained, in just such an elevation of the animal spirits as we had latterly experienced. It was the pursuit, the extension of the idea, which had engendered awe. What would be the result of a total extraction of the nitrogen? A combustion irresistible, all-devouring, omniprevalent, immediate the entire fulfilment, in all their minute and terrible details, of the fiery and horror-inspiring denunciations of the prophecies of the holy book. Why need I paint, Charmion, the now disenchained frenzy of mankind? That tenuity in the comet which had previously inspired us with hope was now the source of the bitterness of despair. In its impalpable gaseous character we clearly perceived the consummation of fate, Meantime, a day again passed, bearing away with it the last shadow of hope. We gasped in the rapid modification of the air. The red blood bounded tumultuously through its strict channels. A furious delirium possessed all men, and, with arms rigidly outstretched towards the threatening heavens, they trembled and shrieked aloud. But the nucleus of the destroyer was now upon us. Even here in Aden I shudder while I speak. Let me be brief. Brief as the ruin that overwhelmed. For a moment there was a wild lurid light alone, visiting and penetrating all things. Then, let us bow down, Shomion, before the excessive majesty of the great god. Then there came a shouting and pervading sound, as if from the mouth itself of him, while the whole incumbent mass of ether in which we existed burst at once into a species of intense flame for whose surpassing brilliancy and all fervid heat even the angels in the high heaven of pure knowledge have no name. Thus ended all. End of section 22section 23 of the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Becker Shadow, A Parable by Edgar Allan Poe Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Psalm of David Ye who read are still among the living, but I who write shall have long since gone my way into the region of shadows. For indeed strange things shall happen, and secret things be known, and many centuries shall pass away, ere these memorials be seen of men. And when seen, there will be some to disbelieve, and some to doubt, and yet a few who will find much to ponder upon in the characters here, graven with a stylus of iron. The year had been a year of terror, and of feelings more intense than terror, for which there is no name upon the earth. For many prodigies and signs had taken place, and far and wide, over sea and land, the black wings of the pestilence were spread abroad, to those, nevertheless, cunning in the stars. It was not unknown that the heavens wore an aspect of ill, and to me, the Greek oinos, among others, it was evident that now had arrived the alternation of that seven hundred and ninety-fourth year when, at the entrance of Ares, the planet Jupiter is conjoined with the red ring of the terrible Saturnus, the peculiar spirit of the skies, if I mistake not greatly, made itself manifest, 
not only in the physical orb of the earth, but in the souls, imaginations, and meditations of mankind. Over some flasks of the red Xi'an wine, within the walls of a noble hall, in a dim city called Ptolemus, we sat, at night, a company of seven, and to our chamber there was no entrance save by a lofty door of brass, and the door was fashioned by the artisan Koronos, and being of rare workmanship was fastened from within. Black draperies, likewise, in the gloomy room, shut from our view the moon, the lurid stars, and the peopleless streets. But the boding, and the memory of evil, they would not be so excluded. There were things around us, and about of which I can render no distinct account, things material and spiritual, heaviness in the atmosphere, a sense of suffocation, anxiety, and, above all, that terrible state of existence which the nervous experience when the senses are keenly living and awake, and meanwhile the powers of thought lie dormant, a heavy weight hung upon us, it hung upon our limbs, upon the household furniture, upon the goblets from which we drank, and all things were depressed, and borne down thereby, all things, save only the flames of the seven lamps which illuminated our revel, uprearing themselves in tall slender lines of light, they thus remained, burning, all pallid and motionless, and in the mirror, which their luster formed upon the round table of ebony at which we sat, each of us there assembled beheld the pallor of his own countenance, and the unquiet glare in the downcast eyes of his companions. Yet we laughed, and were merry in our own proper way, which was hysterical, and sang the songs of Anacreon, which are madness, and drank deeply, although the purple wine reminded us of blood, for there was yet another tenant in our chamber, in the person of young Zoilus, dead, and at full length he lay, and shrouded, the genius and the demon of the scene. Alas, he bore no portion in our mirth, save that his countenance, distorted with the plague, and his eyes, in which death had but half extinguished the fire of the pestilence, seemed to take some interest in our merriment, as the dead may haply take in the merriment of those who are to die. But although I, Oinos, felt that the eyes of the departed were upon me, still I forced myself not to perceive the bitterness of their expression, and gazing down steadily into the depths of the ebony mirror, sang with a loud and sonorous voice the songs of the son of Teos, but gradually my songs they ceased, and their echoes, rolling afar off among the sable draperies of the room, became weak and undistinguishable, and so faded away. And lo, from among those sable draperies where the sounds of the song departed, there came forth a dark and undefined shadow, a shadow such as the moon, when lo in heaven might fashion from the figure of a man, but it was the shadow neither of man nor of God, nor of any familiar thing, and quivering a while among the draperies of the room. It at length rested in full view upon the surface of the door of brass, but the shadow was vague, and formless, and indefinite, and was the shadow neither of man nor of God, neither God of Greece, nor God of Chaldea, nor any Egyptian god, and the shadow rested upon the brazen doorway, and under the arch of the entablature of the door, and moved not, nor spoke any word, but there became stationary, and remained. And the door whereupon the shadow rested was, if I remember all right, over against the feet of the young Zoilus enshrouded. But we, the seven there assembled, having seen the shadow as it came out from among the draperies, dare not steadily behold it, but cast down our eyes, and gazed continually into the depths of the mirror of ebony. And at length I, 
Oinos, speaking some low words, demanded of the shadow its dwelling and its appellation. And the shadow answered, I am Shadow, and my dwelling is near to the catacombs of Ptolemus, and hard by those dim plains of Hallucian, which border upon the foul Sharonian canal. And then did we, the seven, start from our seats in horror, and stand trembling and shuddering and aghast, for the tones and the voice of the shadow were not the tones of any one being, but of a multitude of beings, and varying in their cadences from syllable to syllable, fell duskly upon our ears in the well-remembered and familiar accents of many thousand departed friends. End of section 23 Recording by Joe Becker End of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition Volume 4 by Edgar Allan Poe